Come on. Sorry to disturb you. Uh -huh. My name is Jimmy Horan, uh -huh. and we're in 1405. Mm -hmm. And uh, Tom and Nancy uh, agreed to let us rent this place mm -hmm. uh, for next December through March. Mm -hmm. I was wondering, could we leave for a few days? Or? No, we're leaving in the morning. That's Sure, could not have been more helpful. It's Mayor of the City of Stanton. I call the work session of the Stanton City Council to order for February 10th, 2022 at 530. Uh, the first item on February 9th, 2022, I received a request from Councilor Clathy to participate remotely in the February 10th, 2022 Stanton City Council meeting due to a personal matter that prevents his physical attendance at the meeting. Pursuant to the Freedom of Information Act, I will now ask Councilor Claffey to state the personal matter which makes it unable for him to attend tonight's council meeting. Councilor Claffey. I'm out of town with my wife on vacation. All righty. I'll now entertain a motion to allow Councillor Claffey's remote participation in this meeting pursuant to Stanton City Council Procedural Memorandum Number Three. Madam Mayor. Vice Mayor Robertson. Pursuant to Stanton City Council Procedural Memorandum Number Three, I move to allow Councillor Claffey to remotely participate in the February 10, 2022 Stanton City Council meeting due to a personal matter. All right. Is there a second? Mayor second. Oaks, a second. All right, Councillor Darby, a second. Any further discussion? Hearing none, Ms. Smith, please call the roll. Mayor Oaks. Aye. Vice Mayor Robertson. Aye. Ms. Mead. Aye. Mr. Holmes. Aye. Ms. Darby. Aye. Motion carries. All right, I'll now ask Councillor Claffey to state the remote location from which he is participating. 1403 Surfview Drive, Palm Coast, Florida. Aww. <laughs> Did everyone hear that on cancel and in the audience? <laughs> All right. Thank you and welcome. Thank you. On February 9th, 2022, I received a request from Councillor Dole to participate remotely in the February 10th, 2022 Stanton City Council meeting due to a family member's medical condition that prevents her physical attendance at the meeting. I will now entertain a motion to allow Councillor Dole's remote participation in this meeting pursuant to Stanton City Council Procedural Memorandum Number Three. Mayor Oaks. Um, Councillor okay. Holmes. <laughs> pursuant to Stanton City Council Procedural Memorandum Number Three, I move to allow Councillor Dole to remote, remotely participate in the February 10th, 2022 Stanton City Council meeting due to a temporary medical condition. All right, so there's a motion on the floor by Councillor Holmes. Is there a second? Madam Mayor. Vice Mayor Robertson. I'll second that. All right, any further discussion? Hearing none, Ms. Smith, please call the roll. Vice Mayor Robertson. Aye. Mr. Holmes. Aye. Mayor Oaks. Aye. Ms. Darby. Aye. Mr. Claffey. Aye. 
Ms. Mead. Aye. Motion carries. All right, thank you. Councillor Dole, can you please state the remote location from which you are participating? Yes, 1003 East Beverly Street. All right, could everyone on council as well as the audience hear Councillor Dole? All right. It doesn't sound as sexy as Florida. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well. It's all I can afford. Yeah. <laughs> all right. Um, thank you and welcome. The first item is the consideration of work session and regular meeting agendas. I'll entertain a motion. Mayor Oaks. Councillor um, Brenda Mead. I'd like to make a motion for the discussion and consideration of the recomposition of the nominations committee. And I would propose to add this item to regular meeting agenda C. So you want that on the regular meeting as, right, so we have C. Um, is the recycling after? Okay, all right, so we have the discussion of the Shenandoah Valley Animal Services as D. Do you wanna add it as E? That's fine. Okay, uh, so there's a motion on the floor. Is there a second? This is second. Carolyn Dole, I'll second that. All right, Councillor Dole has second. Any further discussion? Hearing none, Ms. Smith, please call the roll. Mayor Oaks. Aye. Vice Mayor Robertson. Aye. Ms. Mead. Aye. Mr. Holmes. Aye. Mr. Claffey. Aye. Ms. Dull. Aye. Ms. Darby. Aye. Motion carries. All right, so that will be added on as item E, Ms. Beauregard. So if you can just add that on. Thank you. All right, the next item is item two, a presentation of quarterly financial report. Mayor Oaks, I think we have to- Oh, we have the vote. Thank you for the point of order. The... Yeah. All right, so- um, we have a motion, we have a second. Any further discussion? Hearing none, Ms. Smith. But oh, we did, we already we voted. A, the, the, we approved an Min amendment, minutes. but we haven't we approved, approved the, the amendment. amended agenda. The, oh, I'm sorry, sorry, you were exactly right. Okay, so I'll entertain a motion. Mayor Oaks. Um, Councilor Brenda Mead. I move to approve the agendas for the work session and regular meetings uh, as amended. All right, thank you. So there's a motion on the floor. Is there a second? I second, Terry okay. Holmes. Councillor Holmes is second. Any further discussion? Hearing none, Ms. Smith, please call the roll. Ms. Darby. Aye. Ms. Dull. Aye. Mr. Claffey. Aye. Mr. Holmes. Aye. Ms. Mead. Aye. Vice Mayor Robertson. Aye. Mayor Oaks. Aye. Motion carries. All right, thank you. Now I believe we're ready to roll. The next item is item two, a presentation of the quarterly financial report. Ms. Beauregard. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Phil Trayer, our chief financial officer is here to present this item tonight. Thank you, Ms. Beauregard. Madam Mayor, members of council, it's a pleasure to be here this evening. Tonight, we're here to report that on the second quarter, unaudited postings of revenue and expenditures for FY 2022. Year-to-date revenues posted through December 31st, 2021, equal 21.8 million or 31.7% of the annual appropriation. In 2021 through the second quarter, posted revenues were 21, 29 million or 43.8% of the annual appropriation. Year and year variance through December equals negative 7.3 million. This is made up of 4.3 million in one-time CARES Act funding, which was recorded in the first half of 2021. We have a $1 million variance in state highway funding. This is a timing issue. And the second quarter funding for FY 2022 was received in the third quarter and has been posted already. And finally, we have a $2 million variance in year and year real estate tax postings. This too is a timing issue where the FY 2021 year end prepaid payments of real estate taxes, which was posted on June 30th, 2021 as deferred revenue on the balance sheet needs to be recorded in 2022. So the money has been received. We just need to record the entry. Uh, we are 50% through the fiscal year. 31.7 is a little light, but given the timing issues of major revenue sources mentioned above, we're tracking close to normal. On a bright note, local taxes of interest, which have been reported on a couple of times in recent weeks, has been updated since Wednesday, include sales tax through November up 203,000 the same time last year projected to be 540,000 above budget projections. Meals tax through December up 614,000 over same time last year. 
and projected to finish 850,000 head of budget projections and lodging revenue through November up to 27 over the same time last year and projected to be 377,000 above budget projections. All in all, we're pacing roughly 1.7 million above budget projections. On the expense side, we have posted 30.8 million of expenditures and encumbrances or 44.9% of the annual appropriation. From a percentage basis, this is a little higher than normal, but not significantly out of line with previous years. FY 2021 second quarter expenditures uh, finished at 44% flat. 2020 saw a percentage of 41.1% uh, of the appropriation and 19 finished at 42% of the appropriation at the same, same point in the fiscal year. Year-on-year -year expenditures up $2.7 million, which is entirely driven by the debt service transfer of $4.8 million in December. This entry was posted in the second half of 2021. Without this entry, our expenses would be down to 2021 by $2.2 million, and our expenditure percentage would drop to 37.8%. In the area of government admin expenses, we posted savings of $93,410 compared to same time last year. This expense experience was driven by multiple departments, but primarily in the IT department, which had posted CARES Act related expenditures in excess of $200,000 in 21. Judicial admin up 155,000 as compared to same time last year, primarily driven by the Sheriff and Commonwealth Attorney's Office. Public safety posted a year on year savings of 848,000. This variance is driven by the timing of the third quarter Middle River Regional Jail invoice of $687,000. This invoice was posted in December of FY 2021, but in FY 2022, we received the billing in the third quarter. That's the timing difference. We also had one time FY 2021 CARES Act related expenditures from within the fire department, which produced a positive saving variance of $278,000. Public work expenditures are up 242,000 versus the same time last year and is driven by expenditures within the street department for the Berkeley Place wall repair. Parks, recreation, library and culture up 428,000 over the same time last year. This is primarily due to salaries and related expenditures in parks and recreation, as well as library as these two departments have opened up for more normal operations in FY 2022. And we're operating on a limited basis in 21. In the area of planning and community development, we posted a decrease of $686,000 in expenditures, entirely driven by FY 2021 CARES Act funding of $500,000 for support of local businesses, as well as $300,000 for uh, community housing support, which was also recorded in uh, the second quarter of FY 2021. Finally, golf. Um, second quarter golf revenues in FY 2022 finished uh, year to date revenues through the second quarter finished at 119,000 compared to FY 21's 109,000. We had uh, on a year to date basis 6,143 rounds of golf posted in 2022 compared to 5,996 at this point in 2021. Membership count equals 97 with 11 of those members associated with the Riverheads High School golf team. In 2021, we had 20 memberships, uh, which included eight members of the Riverhead High School golf team. On the expense side, we finished with 54,366 uh, in operating expenditures compared to 52,752 uh, in 21 for a variance of $1,614. Uh, maintenance allocations for both years uh, will remain identical until we, we receive the FY 2021 allocation report. At that time, we will use the most recent allocation dollars for the remainder of FY 2022's reporting. We should be getting that report uh, within the next uh, 30 to 45 days. Net loss for FY 2022 equals 85,000. 761, that's year to date, versus 95,256 uh, year to date in FY 2021. With us this evening is James Corbett from our Parks and Recreation Department. He will discuss his current golf operations, uh, membership drive, software implementation, and will be available to answer any questions that you may have. So I will, I will turn the microphone over to James and step aside for a moment. Welcome. Thank you. Madam Mayor, members of council, good evening. 
I know we had some inquiries in regards to an update on the golf course. And so I thought I'd go through some bullet points to kind of give you guys an update and give you an opportunity to ask me any questions. And I'll do my best to, to fill in any blanks that you may have. Um, <clears throat> as a coordinated launch for our membership and our carts, uh, we were able to finally implement our membership drive and, and the launch of our new point of sale system on October the 8th, 2021. This, once again, this was, this was all a coordinated effort that was outlined in the business plan that was submitted to you guys on February 9th, 2021, as part of our revamping the golf course and trying to draw people back and make it a thriving place for the people who want to come to in the city. As a result, I know Phil just discussed that we have 97 members that I would like to update that to 107 as of today. Uh, we, we keep having a steady stream of people sign up as their memberships expire at other golf courses and as the weather allows them to return back to the golf course. We've had, unfortunately, about five and a half weeks where we've had snow and ice on the ground. So some of those folks are just now coming to see us. But it's exciting. Um, our membership revenue projection that we had in the business plan that was submitted was 20,000 for 2022 fiscal year. We've already exceeded that. Uh, we're already up in the $30,000 range, which was which would actually project out to what we had a goal set for the 2023 fiscal year. And our membership sales have already exceeded the past three years total in the past three months. So that's exciting news. So. Um, exactly the effort that we've put into the golf course is being reciprocated back by the public and, and uh, being well received. The morale has is, is definitely improved at the golf course. Um, some of the data that I sent out that made it to council is uh, I just want to highlight is our new point of sale system is capturing uh, complete data, phone numbers, email address, um, city residency, things like that. And uh, you know, the people that are willing to participate and fill out that, it's a requirement if you become a member. So we have 100% accuracy on all of our members in regards to that. And the current update is we have 57 out of the 107 are Stanton residents. Um, 376 total users have a completed profile. Uh, 204 of those are current Stanton residents. 99% of people who have walked through the door has at least given us their name and phone number, which bodes well for us for future marketing that we want to do. Uh, so it's, it's, it's a definite it's a required parameter if you come in that we at least get that minimum information from you. And so that's going to that's gonna bode well for us once we get into seasonal golf. Uh, and we can launch out some promotions that revolve around discounted times that the software will feed back to us that we're, we're slow in. And so we can send out some promotions to fill in those rounds so we can get some key performance index back on utilizing the most out of our tee times to make the most revenue. Um, since we've implemented the system uh, through, through the quarter that Phil was regarding, we had 1894, 894 rounds of golf that's been played, 671 rounds of golf were completed by members, 1,223 by guests, uh, 522 rounds documented by Stanton residents. Uh, some interesting things I'll just throw out there real quick for you about the point of sale system. It has the capability to text everyone that's on the golf course in case we have inclement weather that shows up. Uh, we, can, we can text everyone who's on the tee sheet for the day in case we have a frost delay or some other kind of event that pre prevents tee times being on schedule. So that's all customer friendly. We can, we can email and text message everyone who's a member at any time uh, promoting tournaments. That's something we didn't have the capability to do before. And the point of sale system is building data right now. We're building a database that correlates weather and revenue. So, so we'll get a readout after a year um, to correlate, you know, if, if the weather is 55 and above, what's, what's our occupancy rate? What's our utilization rate? And I know Ms. Mead, you sent out an email later um, this evening about um, some questions you had about golf court utilization. We certainly have the capabilities to do that. And I would love to give a complete snapshot of that. You know, after a full year, I don't want, I don't want to give a snapshot of our busiest times of April through June. I don't want to give it through a dead time um, through October through, you know, December. So I, I just think, as I outlined previously in the business plan, I think after our promotional membership drive is complete, which is coming up this spring, I think it's good for us to come back and analyze the data after a full year and we'll be able to really 
key in on some of these points. Uh, another question you had in your email address is how many of the old carts are still in use? We decided to keep the 10 best and we bought 40 new ones. That way we have a complete fleet of 50. And, um, and that will help us optimize. It's already helped us draw in two new tournaments that we've booked for the season, which will use up all 50. So that's exciting um, just for some weekends already. Uh, and typical roll turnaround that we've had at the golf course would be 100 rounds on a really busy day, but which we weren't able to previously service due to lack of carts. So this will give us the ability to roll over those carts twice in a day, maximizing revenue um, that we can do with the course. And you also had a tournament re um, a question regarding tournaments. I think maybe there might have been two tournaments that we held in the past quarter. I think one was around the Christmas Bowl and the Turkey Thanksgiving Bowl. But really, our big tournament season is coming up. That'll go primarily April through September. And I'll be happy to provide and I'll be happy to provide data in regards to tournaments. But all all rounds that we turn turn in include all tournament play. So I wanted to supplement and answer that question for you. Uh, we will. I'll be happy to differentiate that for you if you'd like going forward. But really for us, it's just total, total rounds played is what we're really concerned with in regards to utilization of the golf course. Uh, the point of sale system has a really neat feature. What it does, it, it, can, it can recommend after a year of data, it can recommend a pricing structure uh, for us going forward based on our heaviest used days and times and our least amount used. Uh, I know so far we have a limited amount of data in there, but I believe Friday, believe it or not, is our busiest day followed by Sunday. Our least busiest day is Tuesday. And our most bu busiest time is, as you can imagine, is 9 a.m. to 12 p.m. So um, it really will help us market and effectively price those slower times that we have in order to maximize revenue for the golf course. And I'll be happy to fill in, answer any additional questions you may have. Are there any additional questions or comments? Yes, this is Carolyn Dull. I had two questions. Um, I was curious how the, the new system is uh, assessing accurately whether they are Stanton residents or not. What, what, key, what fields are they using? Right. Um, that's a good question. I know it's an area of your concern that you had previously. So what we did, we went back, there wasn't a, a default field for that with our, with our supplier for the point of sale system. So they actually added a custom field for us at the bottom. And that custom field goes into when someone completes a full profile, um, that question is on there because previously we had, we had separated by zip code. And I know you really wanted to, to hone down into Stanton residents. So as, as people are willing to submit that information to us, that's when we complete their profile. And also too, just to let you know, part of the marketing strategy that we have, like I said, we've captured 99% of phone numbers and things like, we're gonna incentivize people to come back in and fill out those profiles and give us a complete profile that will also include things like their birth date and things like that, where we can send them out a coupon or you know, something to bring a guest at a discounted rate. And, and that's how we're capturing that information. Okay, and my, my other question was, uh, what is a round of golf? Is it 18 holes? Is it nine holes? Is it 14 holes? Good question. So we, our point of sale system has the ability to, so we only have two different options. We have nine holes and 18 holes. So I, the, the rough number that we have, and I'm going to be within one or 2%, just so you know that, because it constantly changes but 96% of our rounds are 18 holes. So with you know, a few exception of, of some nine hole rounds. Now, what, what'll change about that is we do have an option for an all-inclusive membership that includes, that includes carts and green feed. So if you buy that membership, we have some of those folks that may come out like on a Wednesday afternoon at six and, and play six holes or something like that, but they are recorded as going into the system as a round. All right, thanks. Mm -hmm. Are there any additional questions or comments? Um, yeah, Vice Mayor Robertson. Yes, just out of curiosity, a question that Carolyn asked is, um, is there ever been given thought in the future to maybe uh, 
some young young persons from uh, Stanton High uh, or somebody getting off work uh, a little earlier, you know, and saying, I, I don't have time for a full round. Uh, can they maybe go and purchase, you know, if they're not members, can they purchase a, a six round, a six round uh, uh, hole or, or round? Can they do four or five rounds and just be charged per hole? Uh, I mean, is that just a possibility to maybe draw some other people in? Sure, it's a possibility. So the, the as part of the business plan and the relaunch was a, a, a pricing restructure. So part of that was making the membership make sense and making our daily fees make sense. So what we did with that, something we didn't previously have was as obviously as the day gets later, the price gets cheaper and it gets really cheap after three o'clock. So in a scenario like what you're you know, um, giving there where previously it would be $25 to come play after three o'clock, you can come play with a cart for $15, which makes it a good entry level for anyone who's just starting and, and things like that. So it's, it's, we tried to address that by doing that. And once we get through with our promotional membership, um, we're also listening to customers and getting feedback and so if, if the demand is there, I mean, if the demands for anything there, we're willing to pivot and, and do whatever it takes to draw those people in. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I have a question. Mm -hmm. uh, it, what, with the, the increase in membership, what do you think has been the key factor and what's caused that to happen? It's been a collaborative effort, okay? So, so one of the key things about that, obviously, of course, was the golf carts, you know? So our, as we've talked about, you know, previously several times, our previous fleet was in such a bad shape. And so basically it was an extension from you guys that made the commitment that we're gonna reinvest in the golf course. We priced the membership appropriately to do that. And obviously it's a promotional membership to do exactly what it's doing, to bring people back because we had, we had the morale had been bad there, you know, amongst the public. It, it's just, you know, the, the carts looked dilapidated, dilapidated. We had overgrown trees. Uh, so we had addressed we have taken down several trees. We have created a price structure that makes sense in order for people to join. It makes sense for us. It makes sense for the customer. We have also created, like I said, some ease with the point of sale system. This, the point of sale system is really going to pay dividends down the line, but the, just for the convenience of use, they can go online and book a tea time 24 hours a day. They don't have to call the pro shop or get in touch with that, which takes stress off the front, front line staff at the pro shop. And it's also convenient for the customer. Um, the biggest thing is, is just the re motivation of, of people, uh, to reinvest back in the golf course. Cause they see effort being put forth by the city, uh, to make it better. And that's, that's a credit to the staff in our park maintenance department, a credit to the staff at the golf shop. Um, like I said, we can attract tournaments now that we can accommodate because before it used to be really frustrating, uh, before when people would want to come to us and book a tournament and we just couldn't accommodate it. Uh, or and also too, or that we would be out of carts by 10 30 AM. So a lot of people, we had lost, um, we had lost a lot of the public faith in our, in our golf course. And so, I, you know, it's just, it's just like anything, the word of mouth has traveled. Um, the golf course is in great shape. You know, it will be in fabulous shape here in the spring. It's in good shape. We have a good running fleet. Uh, some, some structures have been put in place. For some better tournaments, some better results, some better things in the pro shop. We've rehabbed, we've already started rehabbing the pro shop. We have new furniture, we've repainted in there. We're having new carpet that's going to be going in pretty soon. Uh, as we build our membership and we can justify, then we're going to visit some things in regards to snack bar, you know, food. So it's exciting. We, we've really got a lot of momentum. And um, it's what the market also calls for. We've already I know this for a fact, we've already surpassed our biggest competitor in membership by three X in, in two and a half months, three months. So, so I'm excited to see where we're going to be at by the end of the summer. Who do you consider your biggest competitor? Ingleside. Yeah. As far as price point, as far as jockeying for membership. Thank you. Yeah. Just one more question. So yeah. Ingleside is not closing. There's no more. From what, I, from what I understand, um, the person who was leasing Ingleside has decided to give it another year and they're on a year by year basis and it's still for sale. And I, and I understand, I don't know this for a fact because I don't talk to the person who owns it, but I, I think if someone comes in and buys it, there's a potential that that agreement ends. All right, any additional questions? I have one. Um, 
as far as membership and rounds, mm -hmm. is there a difference in how much is charged between someone that lives in the city of Stanton versus someone that is not from Stanton? There is not. Okay. All right. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Madam Mayor, members of council, is there any other questions that we may address? Any questions for Mr. Trayer? Bill, I just, just want to make sure I understand. Um, looking at your presentation, you, you made the statement you feel that we are on track as far as receivables. I just looked at some of these categories. I'm, you know, I'm look. We're seven months in. You know, for from July 2021 mm -hmm. to. You know, when seven months that puts us at about 57, 58 percent typically. So I see some things were well over, some things 39 percent public works. Yeah, just um, different things. So, yeah, we have some um, big revenue collections at the end of the year with real estate, and and that's the biggest chunk right there. We're, we're, we're in good shape okay. uh, for this point in the fiscal year. I feel very comfortable where we're at. Um, uh, we are we are on our way to meet and or exceed our budget projections for for revenue. So I feel very comfortable, and these trends will be factored into the FY twenty three budget. Thank you for that, yes, sir. Right, thank you. Okay, now we're a little behind. Yeah, so, we, um, we need to do a little better on the time management. Uh, so we'll, well that's a little right. harder at that. No, no, that's fine. We have some good stuff to talk about. All right, item three is a discussion of city manager search process. Ms. Beauregard. And Mr. John Venn is at the podium. Thank you. All right, welcome. So in January, I guess it was in January, I was before you all before, and, and we talked about your options as it relates to the interim and or full city manager search. And I shared with you uh, some options would be either to go out to do an RFP a request for proposals, a request for quotes, or finding an existing contract with a search firm that has cooperative language in it that would allow you to choose that firm without going out to do an RFP or an RFQ. Uh, currently, there are two well-respected search firms. You have the ability to engage services in based on an existing contract without going out to do an RFQ or an RFP. Those two firms, uh, the first one would be Baker Tilly. Baker Tilly just uh, actually just finished up and has an existing contract with the city of Harrisonburg. Uh, they did a full, I believe it was a full city manager or yes, a full city manager search. And the cost to, to them at that time was $24,500. The Berkeley group, the second group that we have a contract, there's an existing contract with, just um, worked with Allegheny County. I believe it was on an interim county administrator basis they searched for, and the cost to them at that time was $30,000. Uh, as mentioned before, you also have the ability to utilize uh, our human resources department if that's the direction you all would want to go in terms of cost savings. And I would be happy to answer any questions you may have about the options that you have in front of you. Right. Any questions, thoughts, comments? John, you're you're pretty busy. Otherwise, you wouldn't really you have the time to even de devote to it, it. I mean, it is a full blown search is very time consuming from the front end to the back end to the final final part. Um, you know, I think I mentioned this in January, we don't have the reach, our department doesn't have the reach that a search firm would have to be able to try to find candidates that are already out there. That is, I think that the piece that you're purchasing is they have folks who they know they can reach out to that may be a good fit for the city. Any other questions? I have one question. It, it, does it have to be it? you know, an or situation. So you pick a, a search firm or an HR, or can it be an and? Well, so, I mean, it depends on what you want to do. I mean, if, if I think we talked about this in, in January, if on a, for an interim basis, if you want to, to utilize human resources, we could do that. And then you go out, pick a search for, firm to the full city manager search, if that's what you're talking about, Ms. Darby. It, it is. I guess I'm just thinking that like, I see the need, for, well, you know, I see the, the reason why you could say we, we don't have the reach. Mm -hmm. So a search firm would be beneficial in that respect. Correct. But then if you have, let's say, 
let's say, you know, I mean, anybody can apply for anything. So if somebody came in and sent you something, some information, would you just automatically send that to the search firm or would you be able to do anything if, with if, it? If that, no, I think if we had already engaged in the search firm, that, it would, all go yeah, through. that would funnel that to the search okay. firm. That is correct. Okay, you mentioned the, um, all right, so the Berkeley group worked with Highland County? Allegheny County. Or Allegheny, okay, thank you. And, and they, both of these groups have worked with, with small, medium, and large uh, local governments in Virginia as well as outside of Virginia. And the, uh, I, I uh, just want to add, I have a list of the uh, localities that the Berkeley Group has worked for. Uh, the town of Abingdon, the town of Alta Vista, the town of Amherst, the town of Blacksburg, uh, Charlotte County, the city of Danville, the town of Dayton, the city of Emporia, the town of Farmville, the city of Franklin, the city of Fredericksburg, and on and on uh, through Lexington, Lovettsville, Mount Jackson, Petersburg, Pulaski, Smithfield, Surrey, Sussex, Warren, Windsor. They've done a lot of work in right. Virginia. It's very highly regarded. Um, I spoke with a former city manager in Lynchburg who's had quite a bit of experience with the Berkeley Group, and she speaks very highly of them. Uh, uh, Baker Tilly is also uh, very well respected, has done work uh, in, in, the, in the Commonwealth for a number of years. They're a larger firm. Um, smaller percentage of their total revenues come from executive search. And this includes the Berkeley Group. That's not their primary business. Uh, they, they do executive search. Uh, it's almost a way, it's, uh, it, I, I, want, I don't want to say a loss leader, because I'm sure they're not losing money on executive search, but it's really more a way to become um, an integral part of uh, city government. It gives them advantages when they're doing work uh, for the planning commissions and that sort of thing. So uh, both both firms are uh, uh, very, very good. Um, there's another firm that I've uh, recently located, a company called Municipal Solutions. Have you ever heard of them? I have not. They worked in Winchester, Roanoke, Prince William County, and Danville, uh, and, and done work in those in those cities. Um, there are also uh, two additional folks. Uh, one is called... Uh, Gov HR USA. I have heard of them before. And there's another organization called Raftelis uh, mm -hmm. that uh, a woman named uh, uh, Julia Novak, who pr primarily had her own firm, uh, and she's recently joined that company. So uh, there are plenty of, uh, of great firms uh, that that uh, do have done a lot of work in Virginia. Um, some of them uh, are women-owned firms, and and I think you know it would be it would be a statement uh, of our values uh, to employ a, a firm like that. Uh, so um, I think we have a lot of options. Yeah. And my my feeling is that that a search firm, whether you hire somebody from Chicago like Baker Tilly, or whether you hire somebody from Bridgewater like uh, the Berkeley Group. Um, I think I think it's I think we should definitely use that as a means to uh, to uh, recruit uh, a city manager. So I, I think to your point, Ms. Mead, that you have we have two existing contracts that we you all can ride on, if you will, with the Berkeley Group or Baker Tilly. If we look at other firms, we could we could look at to see whether they have an existing contract. Um, Harrisonburg did an RFQ and they targeted specific firms. And that's one of them was one you just referenced in your list. So that's also an option to do. Um, obviously the, and I don't wanna say easier, the probably the more timely one would be using one of the existing contracts, either Baker Tilly or the Berkeley Group. I'm just, I think of, of the Berkeley Group has, 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 has installed or, or hired uh, all those cities, they sound like a good fit for us because this this is it, this area. But I, you know, that's just my my thought. I'm listening, <laughs> Mr. Venner. You looking for direction tonight, or that's entirely up to you. <laughs> or do you I guys mean, want to mull it? Yeah, over? that's entirely <laughs> up to you. I, you know, what what I would say is, um, I want you all to make an informed decision, right? And with all the information that you have, and I don't think it necessarily a decision needs to be reached tonight 
Um, but I would say, you know, within the next meeting or two to get the ball rolling. What is council's pleasure? This is Carolyn Dull. Uh, Mr. Venn, uh, with, with these two that are already under contract that we could, uh, which is the more, more timely option, the most timely option that we have, um, are, was Harrisonburg pleased with their work? Yes, I spoke with the Director of Human Resources and okay. they were very pleased with Baker Tilly. And, and I have not yet spoken with Al Allegheny County. I did and, speak and, with Lexington and I believe Lexington okay. utilized me and they were very pleased with uh, the Berkeley group. Yeah, so, so all things being equal and, and to me, I think being timely in this is really important because we have, we have uh, we're understaffed and, and so, uh, and it's, it's going to be a process anyway, but if these two are, are, don't require us doing an RFP uh, or an RFQ, uh, that saves a lot of time. And, and it seemed like the uh, price, uh, one of them was 24 and change, right? That is correct, 24.5 with, with Baker Tilly. Yeah. Uh, you know, if they've got good reviews and we don't have to RFP and they're, the, the price seems reasonable to me, I wouldn't be opposed to uh, considering that. Can, can you repeat that, Carolyn? I'm sorry, I missed that. The last so, thing you just said. I wouldn't be opposed sentence. to considering uh, taking action now, uh, okay. given the fact that we don't have to RFP it uh, we, the price is reasonable. Harrisonburg has been pleased with their, um, uh, the service they got. Uh, I don't see any reason, any compelling reason to, to like delay it any further because okay. we are short staffed. And, and the Berkeley group was 30,000. They Berkeley is 30. Yeah, 50, Allegheny, yeah, that's what Allegheny. Yes. And I believe that you know, I could defer to Mr. Blair, but I believe with that contract, that's, you know, we would have to see, but I believe that probably would be the cost. Right. Um, one thing, <clears throat> one other suggestion I might make, if I may, is if, if you want to go that route, either the Berkeley group or with Baker Tilly, um, one thing you could do even though it's not a formal RFP or RFQ, and you would be what's called colloquially piggybacking off one or the other contracts, is that you could at your next council meeting have a closed meeting and interview both of them via Zoom, if, if, that's, if that's your pleasure. If, if you as a council would like to at least talk to them before directing staff to hire one or the other. And I would say both have been very responsive to me and my guess is they would be very responsive uh, and would, would be happy to do that. That's the pleasure of city council. I think that's a good idea. I actually like that idea. Thank you. Yeah, I like Ed the Martin. idea too. I just hope we won't, I mean, last time we had this discussion, we kicked the can down the road because uh, Terry wasn't here. And so I'll be uh, here next time. I ain't going. Uh, I know you're not going anywhere. <laughs> <laughs> but I, but, but I just don't want to continue to kick yeah, the can no, down. Not at all. No, don't want that uh, either. To Carolyn's point, uh, you know, we we uh, we need to make sure that we have the right leadership in that uh, in that um, uh, city manager role. Councilor uh, Claffy, any comments? No, I'd be most most happy to uh, interview next next meeting. It would be great. Okay. If we could do a Zoom thing at the next meeting, I'd be very happy. Okay. Can we get that set up? Yep. yep. So I will reach out now. I don't make their schedule, so I will do my best to to Certainly. to uh, to do that. Um, how much time would you all like to allot for each firm? At least half an hour. I was going to say 30, 40 minutes. Okay. For each firm? No, not that long. Be that long. No, not that long. Not that long. Okay. I, I, don't, okay. I, I can't imagine minutes. spending more than 15 minutes okay. with each right. firm. That's what I think. That's 15 fine. minutes each. 
Okay. Half I, an hour total. I, I will reach out to them and uh, be back in touch. All right. All right. That's thank fine. you all. All right. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Um, Can I just ask yes. a point of clarification? What we're doing is hiring someone to find a city manager, not an interim city manager. City manager. We're looking Correct. for a city manager. Okay. Yes. Yes. Mr. Blair. Yes. Yeah. Okay. All right. With that, we're now on break. Uh, we will be back at six thirty-five. UVA game. The okay, we're back from <laughs> break and one game. The one next ball. item is item number four, roll call. And as far as roll call is concerned, the city attorney has given me something to read. We are now at the portion of the agenda called roll call. Roll call allows each council member an opportunity to bring forth matters for staff follow up, either during the same meeting or at a future work session or regular meeting if additional time is required to respond to a council member's inquiry. All right, as far as roll call, I'll start with um, Councillor Mead. I have nothing. Okay. I really don't have anything tonight. Vice Mayor Robertson, okay. All right, Councillor Darby. I, I do, I have one one thing. Um, Ms. Beauregard, um, I think that could you could you explain the process again because I believe there is one where if a citizen is upset with their um, with their like property assessment, what the process is that they need that this, they need to do with the city, sure, and um, if it's being followed or if it has been followed to your knowledge. Yeah. Well, I believe it has been followed. Yes, I have no doubt about that. Um, so yes, um, actually this information um, is um, very well featured on our website as well under FAQs for anyone who's interested. But the first thing people will receive is a notice of assessment. This happened last year and it'll happen again next year because we do assessments every other year. So we don't have an assessment this year. Um, if a property owner is not happy with their assessment, the assessor's office will accept informal appeals for 30 calendar days from the date of the mailing. And last year, that date was March 1st, 2021. So during that period, staff will answer questions about the assessments and work with property owners to, this, to ensure the city data is accurate. So another 30 day period follows during which the assessor's office accepts formal written appeals on behalf of the Board of Equalization. Uh, that happened, the appeals to the Board of Equalization deadline last year was March 30th. 
So this allows the property owner to appeal the assessment to a board composed of three local property owners, including a licensed appraiser, a realtor, and an attorney. <clears throat> so Virginia law provides that the basis for an appeal must include either or both of the following reasons. The property is not assessed at its fair market value and the property is not assessed equitably with other similar properties. Um, as soon as the practicable, practicable after the second day, 30 day period in expires, the board meets and considers the appeals brought before it. And if the property owner is still not satisfied with that decision, he or she may appeal further to the local circuit court. Um, there's three sections that I mentioned. Um, <laughs> According to, in terms of the appeal to the assessor, that's 58.1-3330. The, uh, the appeal to Board of Equalization is 58.1-3378. And this, again, this is all Virginia State Code. And lastly, the appeal to Circuit Court is found in 58.13984. I hope that answered your question, Ms. Darby. It does. I appreciate that. I, I, I think, I just know that, you know, with citizens get frustrated when they when they feel like that you know they're not happy with their property assessment i just wanted to make sure that you know we are doing everything from a city side of things that we can do and just wanted to hear that process again yes ma'am so, thank you councillor holmes um i have nothing to say councillor clappy no i just have a curiosity how do i get out of this and get into the closed meeting? Do I have to hang up on this line and reaccess? I need help. I've never done this before. Uh, yes, you will have to leave this meeting and then connect to the other meeting that that link that I sent. And then I, I come back to this one at 730? Well, <clears throat> actually, before that, when you guys have to reconvene to vote. Gotcha. And Thank the closed meeting. Thank you. Chancellor Dole? Nothing. All right. And I have nothing as well. So that takes us on to the closed meeting for one consultation with legal counsel for necessary re legal related advice and discussion regarding the order to show cause concerning the Stanton Juvenile and Domestic Relations <clears throat> District Courts facilities to a discussion regarding specific personnel matters involving the appointment of an interim city manager. I'll entertain a motion. Mayor Oaks, Ms. Terry Holmes. All right, Councillor Holmes. I move to enter a closed meeting for one consultant consultation with legal counsel for necessary legally related advice and discussion regarding the order to show calls that was served on each council member concerning the Stanton Juvenile and Domestic Relations District Court facility located in the district's court building at 6 East Johnson Street, Stanton. Pursuant to code, Virginia Code 22-3711A7 uh, and 2-2, I mean 2.2-3711A8 uh, and then discussions regarding specific personnel matters involving the appointments of an interim city manager pursuant to code, Virginia Code 2.2-3711A1. Councillor Holmes, you can thank Mr. Blair for that motion. Uh, all right, so there's a motion on the floor. Is there a second? Mayor Oaks, I second that. Right. Councillor Darby has second. Any further discussion? Hearing none, Ms. Smith, please call the roll. Mr. Claffey. Aye. Ms. Dole. Aye. Ms. Darby. Aye. Mayor Oaks. Aye. Vice Mayor Robertson. Aye. Ms. Mead. Aye. Mr. Holmes. Aye. Motion carries. All right, thank you. We are now in closed session. <laughs> We're ready. We're ready, okay. I'll entertain a motion to come out. Of, oh, hold on. Mayor Oaks. Um, <laughs> Chancellor Brenda Mead. I move that council reconvene in an open meeting and certify to the best of each member's knowledge that only lawfully exempted public business matters were discussed and that only public business matters as identified in the closed meeting motion were heard, discussed, or considered in the meeting. All right, there's a motion on the floor. Is there a second? second. Councillor Holmes has second. Any further discussion? 
Hearing none, Ms. Smith, please call the roll. Ms. Dahl. Aye. Ms. Darby. Aye. Mayor Oaks. Aye. Vice Mayor Robertson. Aye. Ms. Mead. Aye. Mr. Holmes. Aye. Mr. Claffey. Aye. Motion carries. All right, thank you. We're back in open session. Uh, this concludes the work session. The regular meeting is to start at 7.30. I'm gonna go ahead and call for a five minute break. So we will start at 7.35. Thank you. Yeah. Robin Stacia. Oh, <laughs> yeah, I'm going to be uh, presenting with Leslie um, from the city. Oh, nice. Yes. Nice Hello. to meet you. Hi, nice to meet you also. We're just having a good chat. <laughs> and <they're>, exactly. <laughs> so, so what is your position there, Robin? She's a oh, consultant. So they... She's a consultant for our um, uh, diversity, uh, equity, and inclusion commission that we're starting. Oh, wow, really? So she's going to teach us how to do it right. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's an interesting task. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah. Mayor of the city yes. of uh -huh. Mayor of the city of Stanton is the volume. You got the volume. Yeah. Okay. You're fine. As mayor of the city of Stanton, Virginia, I call the February tenth, twenty twenty two, regular Stanton City Council meeting to order. Uh, the first item, I would just uh, like to remind everyone to please keep your mask on. We still have a mask mandate at City Hall. Also, uh, it's my understanding that uh, Chairman Kenneth Venable is in the audience, the chairman of the Stanton City School Board, and I would just like to recognize the fact that you're here and we appreciate your attendance. All right. Next is the Pledge of Allegiance. If you would care to do so, please rise and state the pledge. Pledge of Allegiance. All right, the next item is the mayor's report, um, which for me involves the invocation and moment of silence, because uh, tonight is my turn. And I am going to yield my turn for the um, um, invocation to my godchildren, Caleb and Gracelyn Gilbert. And they're going to be joined by their father, Ron Gilbert. Now, Gracelyn and Caleb will be doing a Christian prayer. If you would like to join, um, feel free. If you would not like to join, uh, you certainly have that option. It's with honor that we do invocation on my son's 10th birthday and celebrating life in general. So thank you, Madam Mayor, for allowing us to speak. So my children wants me to lead off the prayer. They was a little shy and bashful. So without further ado, um, bow your heads, please. Dear Heavenly Father, and thank you on behalf for all who have gathered here today. Thank you for the many abundant blessings and thank you for life itself. Thank you for being our creator, creating us in your image. In the scriptures, you have said that citizens ought to obey the governor authorities since you have established those very authorities to promote peace in order and justice. Therefore, I pray for our mayor, city officials, including our police officers, our fire and EMS, 911 operators, our public works, and in particular for this assembled council. I pray for the agenda set before them today. Please give assurance of what would please you and what would benefit those who live and work in our beloved city of Stanton. It is in your most holy name I pray. Amen. Amen. And, um, you mentioned that it was Caleb's birthday today. Um, 
Would everyone join me in singing happy birthday to Caleb? I'm sorry, your godmother has to embarrass you. <laughs> so, happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, Caleb. Happy birthday to you. Thank you. Hey, yes. Carolyn Dahl. Yeah, Carolyn. I just want to recommend that council not quit their day jobs. <laughs> I'm in agreement. I'm in agreement. And for anyone that had to listen to me sing in the microphone, um, I beg your forgiveness. So, all right. Well, you guys go out and enjoy Caleb's birthday. Bye-bye. Thank you. All right. So the next item is the mayor's report. The first item is a proclamation concerning the Stanton Wildcats. City of Stanton, Virginia proclamation in honor and recognition of the Stanton Wildcats. Whereas the Stanton Wildcats, a most outstanding and notable African-American baseball team for, formed in the late forties in Stanton, Virginia. And whereas this formidable team became district champions in 1949 and 1950. And whereas despite segregated parks and public facilities in Stanton and Augusta County, the Stanton Wildcats played their home games at Gypsy Hill Park, euphemistically known as the fairgrounds to a racially mixed audience of fans. And whereas it is fitting to honor the deceased members of the Stanton Wildcats while simultaneously honoring the three living members at the place of their historic beginnings. And whereas to do so, pitcher James Beck Sr., who was 94 years of age, will throw out the first pitch at the Stanton Braves' first home game on Saturday, June 4th, 2020. And whereas, former third baseman Frank White Sr., who was 91 years of age, and former bat boy Samuel Tate, who was 87 years of age, are expected to represent the Stanton Wildcats as the team is recognized and their significant history of celebration with a plaque placed at Moxie Stadium in Gypsy Hill Park, which is known as the home of the Stanton Braves. Now, therefore, be it proclaimed by Stanton City Council that the city of Stanton, Virginia honors and celebrates the team, as well as many other individuals for their contributions to the city, its residents, and the rich African-American history that sustains at Stantonians to this day. Managers, George Stewart and Robert Calls Sr. Pitchers, Charles Kaley, uh, Calfee, did I pronounce that right, Calfee? Uh, pitchers, Charles Calfee, Johnny McCutcheon, Charles Gray, Goodfrey Tate, Sidney Vaughn, and pitcher and shortstop, James Bex, and pitcher and outfielder, Philip Pinnell. Catchers, Dennis Bex, George Harden, Mason Miller, and catcher and second baseman, Alan Jackson. First baseman, Creed Pinnell and Mr. Washington. Second baseman, Lyle Call, Robert Smith Fry, Raymond Huggard, Snooky Pendleton, Herbert Robinson, and shortstop, second and third base, Ronnie Todd. Third baseman, Ralph Davis and Frank White. Shortstop, Reuben Dawson. Left fielders, Charles Venable, and Daniel Wormsley, and left and right fielder, Lewis Venable, center fielders, Lloyd Harris, and Ira Wells, right fielders, Oliver Tate and Robert Vaughn. Additionally, Robert Cause Jr. and William Dunnings, bat boy, Samuel Tate, ball boys, Lee Epps, and Archie Anderson, umpire, Ralph Southall, equipment manager, Raymond Babe Robinson, Treasurer, George Robinson, and bus driver, Roy Kincaid, dated this 10th day of February, 2022, Andrea W. Oaks, Mayor. Now, it's my understanding via Zoom, we have Moon Yin and Jackson Amiss, daughter of catcher and second baseman, Alan Jackson, pitcher and shortstop, James Bex, third baseman, Frank White, Dr. Robert Vaughn, son of right fielder, Robert Vaughn, Bertie Pinnell, connected to pitcher and outfielder Philip Pinnell, and first baseman Creed Pinnell. A representative from the African American Historical Association is here tonight as well. 
So we have a whole lot of copies of the proclamation. So if you would um, like to come down to the front um, where the podium is located, we would be happy to hand those out. Do we have them ready? So. Is that, is that going to be a special? After we hand out the proclamations, if anyone would like to say a few words um, at the podium, please feel free. This is Carol Adull. I, I believe probably uh, Ms. Jackson would, would like to say some words. She's on Zoom. Okay. Yes, I, I definitely would. I definitely would. Is this the time to do that? Oh, hold on just a second, Ms. Jackson. Hold, hold on just a second. Ms. Jackson, um, we're going to hand out the um, proclamations really quick. And then when I come back up, I will um, give you the floor. I want to get a picture with the mayor. Can you get a picture with the mayor? Uh, or, uh -huh. yeah, Awful hot right there. Daughter with you? Yeah, that's fine. Yeah. Here. Let me see if we're going to spin. I want to get your picture. Um, let's see. First, let me get Maury, and then I want to go together. Uh, let's let's do it. Do you want to do individuals? Okay. I got I got you three here. You three are set. Would you like to take a picture with the mayor as well? Oh my God. And gotcha. Okay. <laughs> Y'all three together? Okay. One, two, three. Oh, yeah, there may be other members represented there. <laughs> Ready? One, two, gotcha. Very good. Yeah. Do you all want to do a group picture? Do you want to do a group picture on the dais? Yeah. Would you like to do a group picture on the dais? Sure. Why not? Everybody together? Yeah. Okay. Come on up here, Birdie. <laughs> no, <laughs> that's right. Feel how are you? <laughs> Thank you. Sorry, I needed to come to some. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Okay. Everybody looking? One, two, yes, yeah, smile. Oh, that's perfect. Thank you. How about a round of applause? We are truly amongst greatness. 
And Ms. Jackson, would you like to share a few words? Well, first of all, um, I, I just want to say one thing quickly before I do. I do have remarks, but I'm not sure if there are other members of the teens fam deceased families who are in your audience. Um, so I, I would like, you know, at least to extend that acknowledgement to them. But uh, this is a very exciting uh, event, and um, I'm. I'm thankful to the mayor and council for accepting um, my request uh, to honor uh, the, the Stanton Wildcats. But I have to say uh, a special thank you to council mem member Carolyn Dull, who facilitated this for me. Uh, it's, very, it's very important that we can reach out to our representatives, even though I don't live in Stanton. Stanton is my home and I am very interested in what happens uh, in Stanton. And uh, each time that I have reached out to her, she has been uh, willing to take on the, the, um, the uh, request. And, and I would really like to thank uh, Michelle uh, Bixler and Morgan Smith uh, for, uh, all of our conversation and you're making it happen in the form of creating the resolution. And Chris Tuttle, I, I hope he's there. And I want to mention Chris and Lance Monk. Lance is uh, the owner of the Stanton Braves. And Chris and I started this whole uh, journey actually, uh, getting recognition at the fairgrounds. And uh, there will, as, as you've already read, a plaque that will be uh, place there, Mr. Bex uh, will be throwing out, out the first pitch. And you know, I'm not gonna name all of the people in Stanton who helped, but I do wanna mention Terry Howard, who lives in Georgia and who did a yeoman's job in trying to help me to contact different people and giving assignments really to rally folks to come out. Uh, our culture and our, our heritage uh, is so important. And this is a, a wonderful opportunity to uh, recognize uh, our history and our contribution and achievements in Stanton. And I wanted to acknowledge uh, Michelle Amadi. I asked her to come and accept the, resol uh, the proclamation on behalf of the African American Preservation uh, Organization. And uh, a copy of this would be sent to um, Mr. Mr. Tate. Um, I would like a little indulgence with, uh, for Mr. Mr. Bex and Mr. White, who are definitely uh, there. Uh, well, I don't know if Mr. White's there. I think Mr. Bex and his daughter are there. And uh, if they wanted to say a few words, but to have them come front and center um, alone for at least one photograph, because they are uh, the living members of, the, of, this, uh, of this team. And this is such an auspicious occasion. And I thank all of those who have gathered there to take out your time to celebrate our own. And for those who are on the line on Zoom uh, who have uh, uh, taken out their, their time to share this opportunity. I thank you for your indulge, in, indulging uh, my, um, my desire to have this recognition. I just wish I had done it when my dad was alive. But in any event, uh, this is wonderful. Um, I thank you again. And uh, would you, Mr. Bex and Mr. White, would you? Mr. Bex and Mr. White, can you, uh, can you come and stand in the front to have um, a picture taken? <laughs> we don't mean to put you on the spot. <laughs> but you sure make Stanton look good. What a legacy. Yes, absolutely. A legacy. This is Carolyn Dolan. I just want to tell you, Mooneen, that um, Mr. Terry Howard is uh, watching on the oh, Zoom good. platform. He's a, good. he's a good buddy of mine on Facebook. <laughs> okay, good. If anyone would like to say a few words at the podium, feel free. We don't have any takers? Oh, all right. Yep. <laughs> Ms. Armani. 
Uh, I'm Sheila Mahdi, and I want, just want to say that it's an honor for me to be here to accept the proclamation on behalf of the Stanton Augusta County African American Research Society, which is a mouthful. Um, but I just want to, you know, to let, let everybody know, and we all know that there is great uh, history in the area, and the society has done a lot in preserving and showcasing it for the last 10 years. And I wanna thank um, attorney uh, Mooney Jackson Amos for spearheading this and Terry Howard and so many more. And Mr. Bex and Mr. White and Sammy Tate will have another honor early, uh, later on this uh, summer just to acknowledge what they've done. And there are stellar people within our community who have contributed much and we thank you for having this honor for them today. Thank you. Thank you. Would Thank anyone you. else? Um, oh, yes, sir. <laughs> First, I'd like to uh, give honor to my Lord and Savior Jesus Christ for now me to stay in this old sinful world for 94 years. He's been good to me. Amen. I want to thank the city of Stanton for this proclamation. You know, it's been 72 years, 72 years that we played baseball. It's been a long time. I look at the audience here and it remind me of some of the people that came to our games to see us play. I don't think it's too many of them though. <laughs> <laughs> at, at that age. But I appreciate this and well, Mr. White and Mr. Tate, I was hoping they would be here, but something came up. And Ms. Moonine Jackson Amos, I want to thank her for taking her time out with her committee to, to help celebrate this great occasion. And it's, they say this is uh, Black History Month that we received this approximation, and I appreciate that. But for me, what I have been through in my 94 years, I like to celebrate every month of the year <laughs> of Black History Month. Thank you. Mr. Bex, you must have found the fountain of youth. Yeah, you look you were the youngest 94-year-old <laughs> I've ever met. You are so incredibly young looking. Oh, so what's the secret to life? All right, all right. <laughs> well, thank you so much. Did any council members care to say a few words? Councilor Dole, did you wanna say a few words? Well, just to say that I think that this is a great thing that uh, Ms. Jackson uh, thought of uh, uh, having us do, and we were happy to, to uh, facilitate that. Um, it, and it's good to, to be aware of our history. And, you know, I'm, I'm thinking I went, to, I went to school with Mr. Beck's daughter, or, or, or I don't know if his daughter or her or niece, but I, I went to school with her. But... Um, it's, it's great uh, that we can have uh, uh, something that we can all agree on because, boy, that's rare these days. Uh, and, and I'm happy uh, to have been able to, to facilitate this, this happening for, uh, for the council to do tonight. Great. Thank you so much. You. And I will say I'm glad I'm not throwing out the first pitch. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you to everyone that made this evening possible. And um, with that, go Stanton Wildcats. So. Yay. Thank you. <laughs> Good night. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. If you can come up to the uh, podium.
Good evening to everyone. Those of you who don't know me, I'm Bertie Pennell, and I am the daughter of the late Cree Pennell, who was a wildcat, including his brother, Philip. But I am just happy to say that uh, I really appreciate sharing in this momentous occasion this evening. Um, it's one I'll never forget. And I just want to say that, excuse me, I get very nervous when I talk about my family, but I, I wish my father were here and his brother as well, because I know they are smiling from heaven. And uh, I'm looking forward to June because there's more to come. I'm looking forward to that day. Thank you so much for all that you've done. Thank you, Munin. Okay. You, <laughs> You're welcome. Love okay. you. Love you too, honey. Bye-bye. All right. Well, thank you to everyone. And if you would like to stay for the rest of the meeting, feel free. Um, if you have um, some other things you would uh, rather be doing, we totally understand. <laughs> All right. Good night. Good night. And thank you so right. much. Okay. Thank Jackson you. Jackson and Meese, thank you. Okay. Thank you. Have a good meeting. Oh, thanks. <laughs> And I hope everyone did receive a proclamation. If you did not, um, Morgan, our clerk of council, would be happy to provide you with a proclamation. I have your name and right. I got your name. Yeah. Didn't I? The yep, next item done. under the uh, mayor's report, I would just like to recognize um, the tragedy that um, Bridgewater went through just here recently with the loss of two officers. Um, it was such a tragedy. So many uh, thoughts and prayers go out to the, um, the victims' families. Um, it was such a tragedy. And on behalf of the Stanton City Council, we would like to extend our um, greatest sympathy that we can provide to all of Bridgewater and Bridgewater College. All right. Are there any additional items by members of council? Hearing none, we'll move on to the approval of the minutes. The first set of minutes is the special meeting of January 19th, 2022. I'll entertain a motion. Mayor Oaks. Councillor Mead. I move to approve the minutes of the special meeting of January 19th, 2022. All right, we have a motion on the floor. Is there a second? I'll second that. Vice Mayor Robertson is second. Any further discussion? Hearing none, Ms. Smith, please call the roll. Vice Mayor Robertson. Aye. Ms. Mead. Aye. Mr. Holmes. Aye. Mr. Claffey. Aye. Ms. Dahl. Aye. Ms. Darby. Aye. Mayor Oaks. Aye. Motion carries. Thank you. The next item is the approval of minutes for the work session and regular meeting of January 27th, 2022. I'll entertain a motion. Mayor Oaks. Uh, Councilor Holmes. Wasn't here for that. Okay. All right. Mayor Oaks. Councillor Mead. I move to approve the minutes of the work session and regular meetings of January 27th, 2022. All right, there's a motion on the floor. Is there a second? I'll second that as well. We have a second by Vice Mayor Mark Robertson. Any further discussion? And hearing none, Ms. Smith, please call the roll. Mayor Oaks. Aye. Vice Mayor Robertson. Aye. Ms. Mead. Aye. Mr. Holmes. Abstain. Mr. Claffey. Aye. Ms. Dahl. Aye. Ms. Darby. Aye. Motion carries. All right. Thank you. The first item under the regular meeting is A, a consideration of the proposed capital improvement plan FY 2022 through FY 2026. Ms. Beauregard. Uh, Mr. Phil Trayer, our chief financial officer, is going to present this item this evening. All right. Welcome. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Members of Council, it's a pleasure to be here this, this evening. Tonight, we're here for the final review and consideration of the FY 2022-2026 CIP plan. Uh, that would be great. Thank you. I'll wait a moment until the slides get up and uh, we'll move straight on to slide two as soon as they, they do. Okay, on, on slide two, this year's five-year plan, both scheduled and unscheduled, equals $279,214,991. The 
and was introduced at the January 13th, 2022 meeting, followed by a February 2nd, 2022 special call meeting to further review the plan. The school board is scheduled to approve their CIP at their February 14th, 2022 meeting, and the Planning Commission conducted a public hearing on January 20th, 2022, which was properly advertised, and they recommended approval at the end of that meeting. Scheduled CIP this year equals $110,821,981. General fund, uh, 61.7. School fund, 9.6 million. Water fund, 24.5 million. Sewer fund, 8.8. .8. Stormwater fund, 4.6. And parking fund, 1.7. Slide three provides a breakout of unscheduled and unfunded projects. The unscheduled portion of the CIP equals 168,393,000. Breakout includes general fund 106,557,000. School fund 25 million. Water fund 27.8 million. Sewer fund 5 million. Stormwater fund 4 million. And parking zero. Even though we call this portion uh, the plan unfunded and unscheduled, the CIP itself is actually a plan and that only the items that appear in FY22 and 23 will actually be funded within the 22-23 fiscal years. Other scheduled projects in the outer years, 24 through 26, are in reality placeholders and are plan projects with plan sources of fund. In other words, we do not have an additional 40.5 million in cash sitting in CIP reserves waiting to be drawn down. Slides four and five. Slide four will look familiar to everyone as this summarizes our projects and plan funding sources. Slide four breaks out the detail of the five-year plan. There has been some modification since we first presented the CIP to council. Primarily, we have moved the timing of the Middle River Regional Jail Project back to FY 2024 as this project remains in flux. Slide five summarizes the funding source of our five-year plan by color code. They are as follows. Orange represents budget transfers from the general fund to the CIP fund to create reserves to cover high dollar equipment replacement, maintenance and repair, sidewalks, VDOC matching funds. Um, the total transfer for the five-year period equals 5.3 million. Purple represents carryover budget amendments to fund a combination of one-time projects as well as reserves for greenway and bike paths. Total funding is scheduled for the five-year period, 4.1 million. Dark gray is funded via CIP reserves, very small amount there. Light gray, this project's uh, scheduled to be funded via debt. This includes the public safety judicial projects, fire station and Middle River Regional Jail construction. This total 16.5 million. Red is projects funded by VDOT and these total 28 million, including the Stanton Crossing Road Extension, multiple sidewalk projects, and two additional road projects, including the Bessie Weller Safe Route to Schools and construction at the Richmond Road Statler intersection. Items in blue will be funded via FY 2022 budget amendment, which occurred in January of FY 2022 and includes a $2.5 million funding for future school construction projects, 911 call handling equipment, HVAC replacement of the police department, and Middle River Regional Jail Reserves, as well as undesignated CIP reserves. Light Green is a project funded via HUD funds. This project is a West Beverly Grubert Street sidewalk project, and Dark Green represents the use of ARPA funds, the amount of $2 million for the emergency radio system. On slide six, we'll, slick, yeah, slide six, we'll look at the appropriation status of FY 2022 projects and reserves. In the case of FY 22, it's easy. All items appearing in 22 have already been appropriated by council. Most of the reserves shaded in orange were appropriated via FY 2022's budget. The entry for these reserves will occur in June as part of the year-end process. And after all, operating expenses have been sufficiently funded via actual revenue postings. Items appearing in purple were appropriated via FY2020's carryover, which was approved by council in 2021. The total of these items, 1,475,000. Item seven, I mean, slide seven. Uh, we have the Bessie Wellis Safe Route to School project, which is partially funded by CIP reserves. That's already been appropriated. Items in blue were appropriated via budget amendment number two in, in January. Uh, and of course, again, the final funding for the emergency radio project is scheduled to be with ARPA funds. 
uh, which will require a subsequent budget amendment to be approved by council. As a reminder, city council approved $1.6 million of this project already via budget amendment number three. And this project was originally slated, slated uh, to be funded in last year's CIP with debt service. Items in red, Bessie Wallace Safe Rouse School, Richmond Road, Statler Intersection requires no additional appropriation as these are state funded and the HUD project was appropriated in FY21 with a budget amendment. Slide eight, we look at FY23's funding status. As a practice, Stanton, as we know, has budgeted general fund monies to fund reserves to address high, high, high dollar items, including reserves for fire equipment, sidewalk projects, public works items, and education funding. These items were our expense via general fund transfer and will be included in FY 2023's budget and will be appropriated at the time the budget is approved. The Stanton Crossing Road Extension is state project and no additional appropriation from council is required. The items in blue, again, were appropriated via budget amendment number three, uh, approved in January, 2022. Slide nine provides the status of our current CIP reserves. These balances are scheduled to be increased during the course of FY22 as part of the approved budget. Again, the FY2022 transfer entry from the general fund to the CIP will occur in June and balances will increase at that time, increase at that time according to the summary schedule on page 29 of the CIP or slide four of the presentation. Um, in closing, once again, the scheduled FY 2022-2026 CIP plan totals $110,821,981. The total CIP, including unscheduled projects, equals $279,214,991. And the acting city manager recommends approval as presented. Be happy to address any questions that you may have at this time. All right. Wow, that was a lot. Right. Are there any questions by uh, council members or any comments? I have, I have a question. Right. Mr. Councilor Trayer, Hayes. we've, uh, uh, you and I had a brief conversation about, uh, about using some of the undesignated CIP for FY23 to fast track a project, uh, a pedestrian crossing at Coulter Street, West Beverly Street. Yes. This it, would uh, provide uh, greater safety for VSDB students who are, they're learning to navigate on our streets. And I see them frequently at that intersection with members of their faculty. And I was wondering if that could be fast-tracked. Uh, yes, ma'am, uh, we, we, we do have funding in the unreserved un, un, un CIP uh, in the amount of $350,000. I believe that project's placeholder is roughly 200,000. If council, um, if it's council's pleasure, we can certainly make that change and amend that and get that fast tracked if it's council's pleasure. So what is council's pleasure? Any issues? I'm, I'm okay with it. Okay, okay. Um, then, then I would, okay, and I'll field any other questions. Any additional questions or comments? This is Carolyn Dahl. Councilor Dahl. I just wanted you to tell me where the greenways uh, will show up in the final CIP. Um, community development, ma'am, and that, that, that change has been made. All right, thanks. Thanks for the correction. I appreciate it. It's, it's, it's a better document. I, I, I totally missed that last time. So thank you. And I have one more, one more question. This relates to... Um, when, when we, I guess we call it the monster fire truck. Yeah. Uh, when, when we bought the monster fire truck, yes, um, the intent was to sell old, old equipment and, yes, and to put it, what's the, what's the status of that? The old ladder truck, I, I think that uh, they were, they were holding off on, on selling that. Chief Garber was, was holding off and selling that until all the kinks of the new fire truck uh, have been worked out, uh, mechanical equipment, Type type kinks. I think that that's almost done. Um, I, I think Mr. Horvat was in communication um, with 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 the fire department uh, earlier this week, maybe this morning even. And and I, I believe they're they're getting close to being able to put that out on gov deals. That will 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 reduce that negative fund reserve by whatever amount that that we sell that truck for. Mm -hmm. 
I would, I, I can't speculate how much we'll, we'll receive for that, but I do know that uh, um, used vehicles and trucks um, are, are up about 37%. So I, I think this would actually be, be a good time to help recoup funds to, to bring that negative 734 up to, to at least a break even amount. So yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. That would be great. Yeah. Any additional questions or comments? Uh, Mr. Treyer, on yeah. page four of your slide, okay. um, the Middle River Regional Jail, the um, almost two million, you said that that's on hold yes, at this ma point. Okay. Um, just for clarification for the public, at the second to the top, you have the Middle River Regional Jail, FY22. 200,000, FY24, 500,000, a total of 700,000. Can you talk about that a little bit, please? Yeah, we, we um, have, have been building some reserves um, um, for the last couple of years in anticipation for some sort of construction project, be a uh, renovation or expansion. Uh, it's, it was certainly started off as a renovation, as an expansion. It's been scaled back. And, and right now they're, they're trying to regroup because they, they do not believe that they have support, enough support from the localities, including Stanton, uh, to, to, to expand the facilities. So, so we, we have a million dollars uh, sitting in reserves right now that we can fund towards a renovation maybe, uh, or what, what, whatever the localities ultimately decide. Remember, it takes uh, four-fifths of the localities to approve uh, a vote for any type of construction project. Um, so, so, so we'll have a million dollars uh, waiting uh, for, for any type of renovation or whatever project gets, gets approved. But right now it's been pushed back at least a year. They, they want to see the effects. Uh, superintendent feels like it would be better to see the effects of good time off, which has gone from four days for every 30 days of good behavior to 15 days of every uh, 30 days of good behavior. So, so we're hoping with the effects of prison reform and the modification of the time off uh, that perhaps we don't have to keep people locked up as long as we've, we have been, so. Thank you. Yeah. Right, one last time, any additional questions? If not, I'll entertain a motion. Madam Mayor. Vice Mayor Robertson. I move the city council adopt the fiscal year 2022-2026 capital improvement plan totaling $279,214,991. There's a motion on the floor. Is there a second? Mayor Oaks, I second. That's Councillor Amy Darby is second. Any further discussion? Hearing none, Ms. Smith, please call the roll. Vice Mayor Robertson. Aye. Ms. Mead. Aye. Mr. Holmes. Aye. Mr. Claffey. Aye. Dahl. Aye. Ms. Darby. Aye. Mayor Oaks. Aye. Motion carries. Thank you. And thank you, Mr. Trayer. The next item is item B, a discussion and consideration of the Equity and Diversity Commission. Ms. Beauregard. Thank you. Uh, before I put the PowerPoint up, Ms. Smith, could you put the screen back on the Zoom um, frames for just a moment, please? I'd just like to introduce my co-presenter this evening. Um, so yes, I am I have a co-presenter this evening. Uh, Dr. Rob, Robin Stacia is present with us on Zoom and she is representing the Virginia Risk Management, um, Risk Sharing Association, excuse me, a grant that we received. And so I'm gonna kick off the presentation and then she and I are gonna kind of do some back and forth and then we'll um, wrap it up together. Right. Welcome so. Dr. Stacia. Hi, thank you. I'm glad to be here. Okay, so I'm gonna start, now I will start the PowerPoint. Okay, so this evening, uh, what we hope to accomplish Establish an equity and diversity commission that is represented, that will be represented by a broad cross section of the community. We'll talk about the survey results. We'll talk about the Virginia Risk Sharing Association grant that the city received a few months ago. We'll talk about some draft, res draft resolution and some decision points that we hope you will be able to make this evening and the future needs of the commission. 
so in September, when we uh, first brought this to you, council directed staff to do a survey to help inform the final resolution and the direction of the commission, or at least the uh, direction of how to set up the commission. That survey was conducted between October 6th and December 31st, 2021. There were 195 responses, 174 online, 21 were submitted on paper copies. There was a lot of support for the commission, 92%. That's pretty overwhelming, I would say. And um, this, this survey, the results that we're gonna speak about in a minute really did help frame the staff recommendations that are before you this evening. This dot map represents the, where the respondents said they lived, the addresses that they reported. And I'm just gonna take my mouse if this works. Anyway, 95% of respondents reported they live within city limits. And the two ones that are at the top that look like they're on, I can't do my mouse here, all but about seven or eight were in the city limits. So that, that's, that's pretty good. I think the question that is probably the most important, at least in terms of as we start to talk about the nominations process and who, begin, who is put on the commission or who is um, uh, nominated to be on the commission is top experience and representation. Um, so that overwhelmingly, um, the responses were um, to have some folks, people, individuals with experience with and knowledge of diversity and equity work. Uh, that's why that's the largest. Uh, um, font on, on this slide. Um, other feedback was direct experience with marginalized communities and members of marginalized communities, having a varied and diverse experience or perspective, living in Stanton, knowing the city, um, service experience, being a volunteer, having, being a community advocate, uh, having a college diploma or having an education and having diverse representation across many areas beyond race. And we'll talk about that shortly as well. Some of the top behavioral traits that were um, expressed, and these are a little bit more difficult in an interview to get a handle on necessarily, but I think there's some questions you can ask to see, you know, the biggest one by far was open-minded willingness to learn. Um, so that by far was the largest uh, in terms of the most responses on this, on this part of the questionnaire. Uh, also having people that are active listeners, effective communicators, being committed to Stanton, being committed to improving equity and making it a priority. Um, unafraid of difficult conversations, brave came up a few times. Understanding systemic racism and being a collaborative team oriented individual. Next, we're gonna talk about the top focused areas. And this, this focus is on that question, what are the top five focus areas on which the commission should focus its efforts? I'm sorry if that red is hard to read, but the top two in red were overwhelmingly received the most responses. The first being a diverse city workforce, which is internal. But then I also crossed that with equity and job growth and hiring, which was more citywide. So people in the community clearly care about having um, job opportunities, um, having equitable salaries, um, and, and just having a more diverse workforce, not only in the city, in City Hall, which we recognize is the case for sure, but within the community as well. The second item on here was equity and education. And while this commission won't necessarily have a purview over the schools, they have their own equity process. I would, I think it would be a good opportunity for that process and our process to talk, to have conversations, Clearly the people care about the school system and a lot of these other areas that people identified through the survey are directly linked to that, to families, you know, and, and you'll see some of that as you go down the line, such as affordable housing. Um, so I did speak to Dr. Smith about the survey. So he knows this was at the top of the list and we had a good conversation about it. Um, so we look forward to working with their diversity initiative uh, once we have our commission set up and to kind of learning from each other. Some of the other items on this list, I mentioned affordable housing. Um, community engagement comes up a lot in the survey, which includes more than public hearings, but having outreach to all communities, getting involved, open forums, more diverse participation, opportunities for all to improve. And this was um, including more youth, having knowledge of cultural groups, opportunities, 
having making sure people feel welcome. Um, events that bring everybody together. Some people even mentioned how the Stanton Downtown Development Association can help play a role to make downtown more welcoming. Accessibility services for disabled individuals came up quite a bit. And one suggestion was to create a disability board, for instance. Um, create City Equity Committee. I, I'm not sure, I believe this may have been talking about this commission, but it could have been talking about an internal committee. I'm not entirely sure, but this came up a lot. So um, I wanted to put it on here because it did come up quite a bit. Uh, no, River, no Middle River Regional Jail expansion um, was also a very popular response. And all these responses, by the way, it received at least 10 or more mentions. The ones, and I, I actually cataloged 74 different areas, and this is only 21, I think. So it's, it was a lot to um, categorize. On this next slide, um, more diversity of policymakers and boards and commissions, uh, a civilian police advisory board, um, equity for low income neighborhoods. And a lot of this was around equity and budgeting. How do we budget paths to economic betterment? Um, conditions of neighborhoods, diversity training for city leaders and employees, affordable childcare, um, mental health and community health. Um, an interesting one was how the city services delivery, um, are there biases in how we deliver services? And we should be exploring that. And then equitable, equitable policing practices and training. And this is the final slide on this. So at 22, I was close. Western revitalization came up quite a bit. Um, I mentioned the city employee diversity training. There was a lot of um, comments made about community-wide diversity and equity education, making sure we have equitable transportation options. Normalizing race and equity conversations came up quite a bit. Um, outreach, listen, and engage. Again, going back to the community engagement piece. And then finally, um, focus on minority owned and underrepresented business, including increasing and attracting, giving them opportunities and financial support. So again, I cataloged 74 different areas and this is only 22. <laughs> so there's a lot that, that people wrote and um, cared enough to actually put down an idea what, about what this commission should focus on. So this, this commission should not be bored whatsoever <laughs> with their work. Okay. I'm gonna actually invite Dr. Robin Station now to talk about the Virginia Risk Sharing Association Diversity and Inclusion Grant that the city received. Um, I applied for this grant back in October. It's a $25,000 grant. Only us in the city of Harrisonburg received this grant. Um, so that's a pretty big accomplishment, I think. And so Dr. Stacia, I'm gonna let you um, take it from here. Okay, great. Thank you so much, Mayor and City Council. I'm happy to be here with Leslie presenting um, this opportunity that I'm very excited about. Um, as you can see here, I am the Virginia Risk Sharing Association's inclusion resident. What does that mean? <laughs> that means that since last year, I have been working in a very committed way with all of the members of the Virginia Risk Sharing Association, uh, helping entities, public entities in Virginia look at how they uh, consider diversity, equity, and inclusion for the purposes of, of course, for the Risk Sharing Association, mitigating risk, right? Because we know and they know that one of the riskiest um, aspects of city um, governance and city government is making sure that all of your community feels included, knows that the city is working for their best interest, and that there's fair and equal and transparent opportunities. And so that's what I'm helping cities throughout the state of Virginia learn how to accomplish through their leaders. I do this not just with cities, but I do this uh, with academic institutions, with colleges and universities, with philanthropy, with nonprofit organizations. Uh, I'm a psychologist by, professor, uh, by profession. I'm based in Atlanta, Georgia. Uh, and um, I'm really excited to have this opportunity to work with the city of Stanton if should the, uh, the council decide to move forward with the commission. Next slide, Leslie. So what is this opportunity? Um, as a part of my um, inclusion residency, you know, one of the things that I said um, at that time um, was we really need to have a way for cities 
or entities that are a part of the association to execute on a project, to have a way in which they get guidance, because this work is hard uh, and this work requires expertise. And you can see from your community responses, they recognize that because the number one response was have members on the commission who understand diversity, equity, and inclusion and have knowledge of this. Well, you're fortunate because you would have me as well to help guide the formation of the commission should you decide to go through with it. So we decided to put out a grant. And um, as Leslie said, the city of Stanton won this grant because we absolutely love that the commission, that the city even said, let's do a survey, right? You guys are so much further ahead than some of your, your counter, your colleagues. Um, and that this survey laid the groundwork for us knowing that yes, the city wants this work and these are some of the things that we can do. So what will I do? I'm gonna work directly with the city leadership. Uh, I'm gonna provide consulting expertise on diversity, equity, inclusion. And so I'm gonna shortcut your work. So I bring tools and templates and research and guidance and things that would take you all a lot of time to be able to accomplish. I have all those things. I've been doing this, not just with uh, Versa, but I started with AGRIP in 2000. 15, which is the Association for Government Insurance Risk Pools. And that was a national project. And I was their inclusion resident for two years. So I've done this across the country with cities and with entities that are in the public space. So I kind of come with a little bit of advantage that I'll be able to help move this work along. So we'll help, I'll help you develop a project plan. We're gonna create documents that will support the commission's formation, like a charter and descriptions of the work and ways in which the meeting should be held and all the things that will help to, you know, really advance the organization of the commission so that they can do their jobs and provide training and coaching that will support the commission's formation and help to establish a framework that will ensure their success. So with this grant comes a lot of support, which is really a great thing for the city of Stanton. Next slide. So we've looked at this work in three buckets uh, for the way in which I would contribute. First of all, we really wanna make sure that the city and the council have alignment. And so there's some benefit here for you all as well. Um, we'd love to have another opportunity to sit down with U.S. city leaders and talk about really the overview of what diversity, equity, inclusion is for the city of Stanton and have a common understanding about what you all feel the purpose, the criteria, and the process for this work should be, because that alignment is key. Um, we'd like to partner in helping to ensure that the nominations process supports uh, ensuring a diverse and inclusive commission. So maybe providing supplemental questions, maybe meeting with the nominating committee and providing any coaching, answering any questions in whatever way. Um, it will be helpful to ensure that what you said in the draft um, commission and what the community is saying that we have both diversity of demographics and cognitive diversity, geographic diversity, um, there's a long list of the different types of diversities that we want to have so that it's fully inclusive of um, the city of Stanton. And then I'll be there to help launch it. So as I said before, create the charter, train the members, um, ensure that there's an understanding of the priorities of DEI for Stanton, um, help create materials for an, a robust orientation of these members. I'll facilitate the members and help incorporate the survey data, trends, and other priorities that can help them understand how you do this work at a city level um, and help them establish their structure and then as well as some of the initial goals for their work. Next slide. So now I will shift it back over to Leslie who is gonna lead us into talking about um, the resolution. And then I believe we're gonna take questions at the end. So Yes, great, thank, thank you. you. So yes, now we're gonna dig a little bit into the re resolution uh, in terms of some of the spaces that need to be filled in that you all need to think about this evening. And the first one, um, which is E1, is the number of members. And I know at the September 23rd meeting, we did talk about a number, the number of members. I just wanted to put out there, I think at the time we were hovering around seven to nine members. 
but I was looking and there are, there is a path to a larger group. Um, the tourism advisory board, for instance, is 12 members. Lewis Creek watershed is 10 and the rec advisory commission is nine. And the reason for this um, could be that as Dr. Stacia just stated, the survey results state a desire for representation across many, many areas. And I've just listed a few here, age, generational, geographic, economic, religion, persons with disabilities, youth, race, race ethnicity, LGBTQIA, et cetera. So there's a lot to unpack there in terms of membership, in terms of getting that representation that's desired. So there is a path to have a slightly larger group. Uh, you know, so we'll, we can talk about that after we finish the rest of the recommendations, but just something for you all to think about. Um, under the next section, uh, we would recommend that you appoint members by no later than May 26, which is a council meeting date. Um, point here. This first bullet I'm going to carry, and then Dr. Stacia is going to carry the next one. E4 is just giving some flexibility to us since we are in a time of transition right now. Um, so that's just somebody will be supporting the commission. <laughs> That's basically what this bullet means. And we have some, we need some flexibility given where we are right now with, um, in terms of uh, our, our um, overall structure and the organization right now. Uh, Dr. Stacia, would you like to take the next bullet and then, then the next slide? Absolutely. So within the draft commission, it called for one public hearing. And based on my experience, as well as um, what we know about ensuring uh, that all voices are heard and that the commission itself embodies um, the values and the principles of inclusivity, we want to make sure that folks don't just have to come to the city hall to be heard. So while we would have one public hearing, we're also recommending that there will be additional community conversations throughout the city of Stanton. These community conversations are amazing at allowing uh, for the, exactly what we learned through the survey that you know, members of your community want to be heard, they wanna have a voice, they wanna share their opinions, but we know that people have different constraints to their ability to come uh, to just one hearing, whether it be um, different abilities, uh, single parents, um, work hours and shifts, uh, uh, transportation, age. So we wanna make sure that we create multiple opportunities for engagement. So we're proposing that this be added additional community conversations. Um, next slide. So we're also um, proposing that the time frame be at the upper limit. In the draft, it's at 12 to 18 months. Um, as I've done this work with cities, um, it's hard <laughs> to do this work even with a small group, let alone a city, and with volunteers. So your commission, they are volunteers. They work full-time jobs or are retired or have other responsibilities. Um, so we're proposing that the time frame be um, at the outer limit of 18 months, but of course that the commission keep the city up to date. So if the commission is um, appointed by May, we would have the orientation and the onboarding for the commission in June to July and establish their work plan um, by July to August. They would then be able to start executing on that work plan. And so we're proposing that they would do an update to the city council in December and that they would do their final report a year from then in December of 2023 because that would give them ample time for all of the community conversations, for uh, getting more data and doing all the things that we develop in the work plan, which you would hear about in December, 2022. So um, that's the recommendation for that. Next slide. So uh, this is our last slide before we open the discussion. So I did speak to you all about a budget for a commission. And at that time, I was able to secure the grant. So that has filled that gap for now, which is wonderful news. But I think in 23, whether it's part of the proposed budget or, you know, I was just thinking about this, maybe we give the commission, you know, some time to work and do something a little bit later in that fiscal year. I would expect you to see a recommendation from me about a budget for the commission um, as we see how things are going with them and kind of what needs they will be having. Um, 
So uh, I believe we'll have Dr. Stacia probably through August. Right. Um, mm -hmm. So um, if after that time, we'll have to, you know, do some um, stretching of our budgets a little bit to continue that work. And so having something as part of the 23 budget would be very helpful. And so I'll be putting that together. Um, so you can probably expect to see that as well. Okay, with that, uh, I would be happy to open the floor for questions, discussion. Are there any questions or comments by council members? Yes, this is Carolyn Dull. Um, I, in terms of the uh, public hearing and community uh, conversations, I, I'm all for that. Uh, however, I also want to acknowledge that we have the technology in council chambers uh, for people who couldn't even get to a to any public meeting, but mm -hmm. could. So we want to make sure, or I would like for us to make sure that we have uh, periodic uh, a conversation here in City Hall so that people can call, that can Zoom in or call in and still uh, be heard. Because uh, mm -hmm. I think there are folks who, you know, as you said, they either have little kids or, you know, they're too disabled to, to be mm -hmm. out or immunocompromised right. or, you know, the list mm -hmm. goes on and on. And, yeah. and I don't want us to uh, not give them a chance to, to be a part of the, the communication. Um, and, and then um, when, we, when, we, when this is over, are we going to get, are we going to be able to see demonstrated results from this commission or is this commission going to tell us recommendations of what should happen to get us results. I'm a little confused how, how, how it would work. So generally, the com so I, well, I'll answer it a little bit. I think um, the initial results that you find from a commission that does not have, these are again, volunteers, so they don't have authoritative power, you all do. Mm -hmm. They're there to be your voices, your ears, to vet through some of these uh, concerns that have already been raised and to bring to you ways in which you can create um, equitable changes. You can uplift uh, those who are traditionally or currently struggling or feel marginalized or feel that their voices aren't heard. So the first initial result, yes, you will receive an impact because your community will trust you. They will believe in you. They will believe that the city and that its leaders uh, are interested in their current state and want to do something within your power to give them opportunities. But what happens with that information is completely up to this commission in terms of how that information changes lives, conditions, culture, practices, and situations. And, and I think, and I'll let Leslie answer, um, sometimes, and what we want is certainly for where there is authority within the city as they're learning to make certain changes, that they make those changes. If it's within their authority, that they do that. But then there may be some things that are outside of their authority that they need approval to do. But I'll let Leslie answer that as well. I think, I think you answered it perfectly. I mean, there could be some things that come out of this commission that require a budget appropriation, that require money, um, you know, that require additional resources, for instance. So those would be decisions council would make. Um, so I think Dr. Stacia answered, I couldn't answer it any better than she just did. So. Um. But, but I, I think, I, can, I, can I say one thing, Carolyn? I think your comment is right. We do want to get some wins here. We want, we want yeah. people to feel like they don't have to wait five years yeah. to see a change. And so I think that the close communication with council will help Leslie and her team think through what can we do now? And then what requires more methodical budget and strategic execution? And to be able to do things that you can do now so that those who are in your city can see that things are changing um, to their, for their betterment. Yes. Yeah, and I'll, I'll just add my, my own personal example was uh, a, a few years back, I, I asked the city manager, if, could we do a review of salaries? Mm -hmm. um, were women making 
-hmm. the, the same as men for the same job. And so after some, you know, initial kind of false starts with data, they did manage to do that. And lo and behold, there were three women who were not being paid equitably and, mm -hmm. and that got fixed. And so even though I don't know who they are or anything, but um, I felt, I felt good because you know, it's a deliverable. We we yes. did something, you know. So I think any if we can find something like that uh, sooner rather than later uh, to at least start the process, it it, it gets people uh, motivated. <laughs> Absolutely, and it gives them confidence that yeah. this isn't just a check the box activity. Right. I agree. Yeah. yeah. Absolutely. Vice Mayor Robertson. All right. um, a couple things. Um, I'm probably going to get myself in trouble, but that's all right. Um, I, I agree with what Carolyn said. I've, I've got several things. Uh, I am one that truly, truly believes in what Martin Luther King said. I truly believe that you need to judge somebody on the content of their character and not the color of their skin. I truly do believe that. I truly believe that if a woman is doing the exact same job that a man is doing, they need to have the same salary, the same benefits right down the, the line. I truly believe that. Councilman, Councilor Mead and I have had this discussion and we maybe we disagree on that. Um, I, I totally disagree with the idea of having quotas in our hiring system. Um, you know, if, if we have an entire city staff of, of blacks, so be it. If it's of Hispanics, so be it. It's the person that has the best ability for that job needs to get that job. I truly believe that. Um, if, if they're LGBTQ, so be it. I, I don't have a problem with that, but I also have a problem with, uh, we, we've had that discussion. Well, this, the makeup of the city staff doesn't quite me, uh, meet the, the makeup of, of how many per, percentage of blacks in the city, percentage of Hispanics in the city. We've got to get people to apply for those jobs. And we are having a hard time doing that as well. But if they are qualified, amen. We need to hire them. Um, and so, you know, I may not agree to every recommendation that comes across, but I definitely will take a definitely take a look at it. A absolutely. You know, there was a there was a couple recommendations in, in in these that I had to kind of like gasp and say, I don't think I quite like that one, but. Um, but anyway, I, you know, I definitely will be a yes in support of this commission because I do think we need to take a look at it. We need to take a look at uh, everything that it entails. This is Carol and, Adol again. And, 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 so, the, the, uh, could I just respond to the vice mayor? Absolutely. Because, yes. because, because he hates that. <laughs> no, I don't. <laughs> uh, because he might have said a great example of a deliverable. If if he's saying we don't we don't get people to apply, right. then it's like, well, okay, we need to you know advertise more and get it out there and and uh, to that we want uh, different ethnicity and races and genders and whatever to apply for these positions. So, see, Mark, you you right. you already did the first deliverable for me. Come well, on. there you go. Every now and then, <laughs> uh, I surprise you. Yeah. May, may may I respond as well, Mayor? Yes, please. Thank you so much. Um, I just wanted to clarify a couple of things, um, Vice Mayor. First of all, there, those were not recommendations. You haven't received any recommendations today. No, I understand. What, I understand. what you saw in that report were comments that participants in the survey said were important to them. They are not recommendations. Secondly, I agree with you. No one is in favor of quotas. That is not um, a practice for diversity, equity, and inclusion. The practice is access, which is what you named. The practice is how do we ensure that there is fair and equal and transparent access to opportunities? Because we believe that once people have access and if everyone is equally qualified, 
then those who are hiring authorities have the best pool of candidates possible. And that typically those who are of color or LGBTQ or who are Latino or Latina have a fair opportunity for those jobs. So nothing in those, those survey responses or in any recommendation should ever say a quota because that is not what we want for diversity, equity, and inclusion, but we do want access. And what I have found in my work is as Councilwoman Dole says, quite often the way in which we post jobs, how we hire um, in terms of the announcements. And also there's this thing called, um, you know, um, perception. Sometimes perceptions and bias or un how we're uncomfortable. So sometimes even training those who we, who are doing hiring on how to be more open and how to ask great questions, all create better opportunities. So those are the kinds of things that this work does, but it does not call for quotas. Thank you. Councillor Claffey. Oh, Mayor Mayor, I was just, I just want to um, point out in the interest of, of the perception of timeliness, maybe we want to think about recommending an advancement of the timetable. I, I saw that we were talking about December of 22 and December of 23. We, both, we all know on council that we only have one meeting in November. We only have one meeting in December. There's a lot of extraneous things that are going on at that timetable. I, I think we need to have something going on in the fall when people are able to get out and get to meetings and hear what we're doing and possibly let's get this thing into a, a September, October timeframe if possible. Now I know we, we have to set this commission up first and I'm, I'm concerned about how we're gonna go about doing that. But I think that we really need to be pushing something not in 10 months, but in six months to, to get things off and rolling. That's just my opinion. So the commission will start as soon as you you um, appoint it. Those dates were report out dates. Those were update dates to you, but they'll be working in the interim because they have to do all this work in order to, in December, give you an update on their work. Well, do you think so, it would be possible yeah, for us to get report by October? I can't say that because I, I, okay. I think well, we I have know. to stand them up and we have to do what I'm going to help them develop a work plan. And I, I, I don't know that, but I think- I, I just want to forewarn you that, I just want to forewarn you that once you get to a, the second half of our year, we've got lots of courthouse issues that are going to be coming up after November. There, there's going to be a lot on the table and maybe we want to get this off and running ahead of that. Well, I think once we get the commission appointed and we see who those individuals are, then we'll be better able to talk about what the timeline is because they're the ones that are going to be doing the work. So I right. can't, I don't feel comfortable saying, uh, and I don't know, I'll let, certainly will defer to Leslie as well. Uh, but my practice is, is that I wait until I get my team <laughs> and then you sit down with the team, you, or, you have a great orientation so they understand the scope of this work and then you develop your work plan. Okay, and they have fair. to have a voice in that work plan. You know. Lamy, did you have a comment concerning this? I, I did. Um, uh, in last year's uh, budget conversations, there was a discussion about um, a new position for the city. Um, and so I don't see that new position in this year's, the, the fiscal year 23 budget. Um, Ms. Beauregard, would you talk a little bit about why that position is not in the FY23 budget? Well, it, we haven't presented the 23 budget yet, obviously, so we're still in FY22. My intent, however, is to put as much focus on the commission at this time, getting that set up, um, and to really put the energies toward that commission, this commission at this time. Um, I believe that's the um, focus um, that you all have given us at this, you know, to go forth and do. So any resources, um, I would prefer to be directed at the commission at this time, allow the commission to then have input into something such as an equity position in the future when that time is, when they believe that time should come and they can- I agree with that. And I don't, I don't have a problem with that. I just wanted to make sure that the subject was addressed. 
Um, it, and it did come up in the survey. Yep. Several folks did mention it. Um, but again, I think that's a very good discussion for the commission to have when they start their work as to when that, when they would believe that they were ready to do that. So. And just in terms of the time frame, this is such important work. And I, I think to cut a time frame short um, would not give the commission the opportunity and the resources they need. This isn't, this isn't, we're not talking about, you know, one or two meetings uh, for this group. And if it's a commission of nine people, for instance, um, you know, scheduling meetings uh, and, and, and uh, expecting folks to contribute what they need to to the commission, I don't think uh, we should rush this. So um, I would be in favor of letting the process tell us uh, and letting the commission tell us what time frame they're comfortable with in terms of making recommendations and, and reporting to us. Vice Mayor Robertson. Um, and Steve, I, um, you didn't met, Councilman Claff and I did briefly talk today um, uh, on the phone and I thought he was gonna bring that up, but I'm kind of in um, agreement with his, his thought process. And I think it was in, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, Leslie, mm -hmm. but in the makeup that the nominations committee was going to uh, name the, possibly name these commissioners. And Steve and I were kind of in agreement that I don't, we don't actually like that idea simply because we thought it pressed, it put too much, um, maybe too much of responsibility for the makeup of the committee on three people. Believe me, there's enough uh, of, of people on the council and outside don't like the idea that we do it anyway, but you know, they did, that is what it is. So we were, all, were kind of thinking that each council member would get to name a, a committee member, um, the city manager acting or interim, uh, whatever be the case would name one. And then possibly even a, Steve, we talked about maybe even a, a local judge would name somebody, but that's just, that was just some thought processes. Uh, uh, Steve, have you got any other ideas? Well, I just wanted to bring up that originally um, when this was mentioned, it was the city manager had put together the golf committee and it was a, a, a across the board throughout the city. And I think that you might get a, a better variety by having each member of council recommend a candidate to go on this, as opposed to putting the pressure on the nominating committee to come up with a, a diverse group. And I, I, uh, I am interested in expanding out who all gets a say in uh, uh, proposing who the people should be on this. I think the the more variety we have, the better off this commission is going to be. Right. Any additional comments? Well, I, I think that um, I, I, my impression is, and I've been uh, involved uh, quite a bit in getting this uh, survey out. Uh, and I, I want to thank Sheila Amadi uh, because she has been a real leader uh, in the community in, um, in getting responses. In fact, I think I remember from one week to the next, I had a conversation with Sheila about the low response rate we were getting. And she went to work uh, with some other folks uh, uh, and uh, the, the response rate jumped. So I, I think uh, we have the people uh, in the community. I, I think that if we opened up uh, a, a recruitment process, we, we, I think could easily get uh, the people we need to man this, uh, this commission. And I, and I think that uh, I, you know, it, it is a big responsibility and that's why I proposed or intend to propose that um, I become a member of the nominations committee. You, you, don't, you don't have to make me a permanent member. Uh, I'm, I'm gonna be on city council until December 31st of this year. And then my time on city council will be over. I would, uh, I would very much like to be, uh, to leave city council, knowing that we had a strong commission uh, to, to deal with this issue. So uh, my feeling is that, uh, is that we have, we will have the people we need. I'm not concerned 
that it's going to be difficult to get nine people together. In fact, we'll probably find ourselves with a surplus of people who are interested in participating in this process. Any additional comments? This is Carolyn Dole. I, I think we should certainly have some kind of criteria for people to be on the commission. I mean, they need to be have an interest in it, but the, a little bit more than that, um, so that because they're going to have to do a lot of work, so they have to be really committed to uh, improving our our diversity and equity and inclusion in the, throughout the city. Um, and I thought originally that uh, we would ha have an application process and that the entire council would like interview people and then select them together. But um, I can see not having the nominations committee do it because it's not, it's not a, the tip of one of the typical boards or commissions that we have. Correct. Um, I, I was thinking too, the same thing as uh, Councillor Dole actually, I mean, I just thought that that was, we would make suggestions or have some type of application process and then we would all come together and go through it and decide, you know, who we felt would best serve this, this commission, so. We'll have to amend the resolution because it specifically says the oh, nominations. Committee. John said a lot, Mr. A lot. <laughs> yeah. Good, yeah. John, can you address that please? Uh, Mr. Blair. Of Our city attorney. Mr. John Blair. 934. <laughs> Good evening, Mayor Oaks and Council. I'd, I'd also point out in addition to amending the resolution, um, we'd probably need a separate action to suspend Council Procedure Memorandum Number 2 because that requires all... Uh, boards and commission appointees to go through the nominations committee. Um, so, yeah, I, that, you know, again, the resolution would need some um, markup, but also you need a separate motion to suspend your process that you use to appoint to city boards and commissions as well. No, I mean, does it have to be I don't like, I'm not sure I like the idea of it being that broad. Can it be that we suspend uh, number two for this particular item? Oh, absolutely. That, yes, sir. That's, did I, we I do can. that for the golf committee? How did, yes. Yeah. Yeah. That's what I was getting ready to say. This is Carolyn Dahl. Couldn't we, um, instead of suspending uh, the procedure, uh, th that memorandum, uh, couldn't we? vote to uh, add all the council members to the committee for that one that, that one uh, board that one commission. commission say it ends up the same way you could uh, at the same time well that that's one way to do it I I think the reading the resolution if if you wanted to basically have a committee of the whole, which I think is what you're referring to, Ms. Dole. We can come back at the next meeting with a resolution that would do that and, and would incorporate all your policy choices tonight. Okay, that's good. Sounds good. Yeah. Okay, can you repeat that, please? <laughs> well, you um, have some decisions to make, obviously, on number of members and the other decision points that Ms. Beauregard went through, but what we can do if, if, if what I'm hearing is you would like, in effect, to get all the applications and then meet as the council as a, what, what it's really called is a committee as a whole, which means the whole body is the committee. Um, we'd have a resolution that would state that for this particular commission that the council will convene as a whole as the nominations committee. And would that be a closed meeting or an it, open meeting? It can be a closed meeting. Um, obviously, typically that's what we do for all other boards and commissions so that you can have a free flow with the applicants that you choose to interview. 
Any additional this questions? Is, yeah, this is Carolyn Dull. Uh, I'd like to ask uh, Dr. Sasha, does she, it, it, with her experience with other groups, has she seen an ideal number? Because I would certainly defer to someone who has experience with it. I worry about, you know, uh, small group, you know, interactions. And if you get too many people, then it's, you know, but ha have you seen a, a magic, you know, the sweet spot? Yeah, that was my question <laughs> I too. I have seen the sweet spot. And actually, I, the, what we originally had in this presentation was 16. That is the mm. sweet spot. And I know that's larger than what you guys have ever had. But when you look at the kind of diversity that we need, again, this is the reason. You need geographic diversity. You want age and generational diversity. You want um, race and ethnicity diversity. You want professional background diversity. You want perspective of, of experience diversity. So there's so many different kinds. Now, yes, sometimes and often you get someone who represents two or three aspects of the kind of diversity that you want. I would say that you could give yourself a range. The minimum really is 11 to 12. You should not, nine is just not a functional number. Nine exhausts people. I'm telling you, they are just exhausted. It is too much work. The when you tweet, want an the, odd the number, best, um, sorry, in terms of- I interrupted you, but would you, when you want an odd number, because uh, you can end up with a lot of ties there with, if it was eight and eight or- And like that- and 15? And that 15 is fine. 11, you could give yourself a range of 11 to 15. And then if you have 11 and you think, man, this is the ideal group, we've, we've got our group, you stop. But if there were a couple of other, I would hate for you to not be able to choose a couple of people who were stellar. And you say, you know, we can't because we said we're only going to do nine. Um, quite often I have organizations who do a, a, a minimum and not to exceed number. So you could do 11 to 15, um, which would give the council the flexibility that you need. What is council's pleasure? I like I'm going with 11 to 15. All right. I'm good with that. Vice Mayor? I'm fine with that. Same here. All right. Well, it looks like we have our number, 11 to 15. And given that we're now, um, you all are as a group, going to be doing the nominations um, work. I want is, are we still going to shoot for May 26? That's fairly ambitious, but I think, I think we can do it. I think we can push on and get this going. What do you all think? Yes. We can Sounds do good. it. All right. Can I make a compliment, Mary? Oh, yes, please. I think that's amazing. <laughs> <laughs> I really do. I'm thrilled. Um, that all of you would like to participate and that you would like to make sure that you get this right as a group. So that is really, that in and of itself, we want leadership from the, from the top, just sets the tone. So that's fantastic. Thank you. So okay. this is Carolyn Dolan, just procedurally, because, you know, that's my thing. Uh, we need to have a an application, I think, that has some criteria or, mm -hmm. and if you have samples, you could, so, because we need to get that going right now so that people right. can apply so that we can then review them. So that, that would be the next priority. Dr. Stacia, could you coordinate with uh, Ms. Beauregard, Leslie Beauregard? Yes, I can't. That's, that's my job. That's oh, what you. this grant. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> Yeah. That's what this grant is here to help you do. And I am at your service. So yes, I will. Yeah. Thank you so much. So I think the only other decision point at this time is the report dates. Um, there was some discussion. We had said the initial report would be December, 2022, um, final report in 2023. Um, I heard a few discussions around either leaving it to the commission, letting them decide, or we could put these dates in there. And then if they are super awesome, they get it done early. And so I think there's some flexibility we could probably provide ourselves in terms of some language, if I you all wish. Just stay, stay with, with those with dates. And stay with the dates. They come okay. up yes. Yeah, could, we, could we say like no later than December? Yes. So if they get done early, we can get it. Yes. 
certainly Sounds good. can mm -hmm. shoot for October, but we'll take December if we have to. Mm -hmm. hey. Actually, it does say not later than in one part. I just didn't put it in the other part. So that was my mistake. So we're good. Mm -hmm. um, right. So then I think we need uh, some dates in the motion. Well, I, oh. I were numbers. Say, I will take what's been discussed tonight and, and do the Finalize committee as a whole. Weeks. And bring have something on your next agenda. That's fine. There's no action this evening. So no action this evening. All right, nope. Dr. Stacia, thank you so much for helping us navigate through this process. <laughs> well, I am excited. I was, and and I will tell you that Versa is thrilled that the city of Stanton applied for this grant. You all, they consider one of their largest and most important members, and they're very excited that they were able to offer this support so that you can get this commission up and running. So I'm happy to be working with you. Thank you. And thank you for the grant money. <laughs> we appreciate it. Thank right. you, Dr. Stacia. All right. Good Anything evening, else? everyone. I will Good leave. evening. Good evening. Again, thank you. Bye. Right. Bye. Bye. Mayor Oaks. Um, yes. Uh, I'd like to me. make a motion. All right. Uh, um, I'd like to remove item E from tonight's agenda. I don't believe it's necessary anymore. Okay, All right. there's a motion on the floor to remove item E. Is there a second? I'll second. All right, Councillor Holmes is second. Any further discussion? Hearing none, Ms. Smith, please call the roll. Ms. Mead. Aye. Mr. Holmes. Aye. Mr. Claffey. Aye. Ms. Dole. Aye. Ms. Darby. Aye. Mayor Oaks. Aye. Vice Mayor Robertson. Aye. Motion carries. All right, thank you. I want to thank everyone that participated in the um, survey. All right, that takes us on to the next item, which is item C, Recycling Center Update. Ms. Beauregard. Uh, Jeff Johnson, our Public Works Director, will lead us through this item. Right. Welcome. Good evening, Madam Mayor, members of Council. I know we're running late, so I will get right to it. Uh, it has been about a quarter since I updated you. Um, There you go. Um, real quick background, it's been uh, a little over six months, about eight, uh, seven months now. Uh, this update will take us through December. So the first six months, just a reminder of when it all happened, the things we're looking at. Uh, uh, the background, our new hours, which we uh, implemented right after my last update, uh, nine to three on Monday, Tuesday, Thursday, Friday, eight to noon on Saturday. Uh, and if you remember, that was because we were having trouble finding the labor to support the uh, original hours, which were a little bit longer. Um, even after we did that, uh, our labor situation got much worse after November of, uh, in November, uh, but we still managed to hold those hours and those are the hours that we are operating with right now. Uh, our participation metrics, you can see a little bit of a dip from November to December. That's of some concern. Uh, we're not sure if that's a seasonal variation uh, due to the weather or the holidays, or if that is in fact uh, a result of the change to the hours. Our collection is actually uh, pretty steady. Uh, I know some of those uh, commodities seem to hop, hip hop all over the, the map. Uh, cardboard, glass, we deposit in large chunks. So whether something gets dropped off on the 30th of one month or the second of the next month uh, makes a big, a big difference. But uh, overall, those numbers are settling out uh, and are fairly constant. And as they compare to uh, what's happening up the road in Harrisonburg, uh, these ratios haven't changed much. Uh, uh, we still out collect them on paper because their paper vendor is much pickier than ours is. Uh, they still out, out collect us on cardboard because their cardboard vendor provides a downtown satellite drop off uh, that we can't replicate. We're doing a little better in aluminum. Uh, they beat us in metal because they are set up to accept scrap metal not, metal, not just metal cans. For reasons that still escape all of us, we just seem to get so much glass. Um, Wine bottles. No. Yeah, uh, pound for pound, person for person, we are out collecting them three to one in glass. Uh, I could not tell you why. And then uh, in, in plastic, uh, which is we are both uh, have been using the same plastic vendor with the same uh, the same conditions. Uh, we still are out collecting them. Uh, actually, we've opened up an even wider gap than the other update. 
uh, which is uh, good news uh, concerning that was a commodity that we didn't collect for a couple of years. All right, let me talk about labor costs because that was the story of this past uh, three months. Um, November and December, uh, we got into a real labor crisis in refuse and recycling got drug along for the ride. Uh, in those two months, if it were not for the effort of other public works personnel from streets, from utilities, uh, and especially the folks in traffic, uh, we would not have been able to run the recycling center. I don't think that there was a single day in those months when there wasn't someone uh, chipping in to, to make it work. However, uh, with some help from Phil Treyer, from John Venn, Steve Rosenberg, we were able to solve, or we we're in the process of solving our labor issues in, in refuse. And I'm happy to say that for the past three weeks, uh, recycling has been running under its own power labor-wise. Uh, and uh, we hope that will continue because uh, just like pretty much everything else in public works, labor is the weak link. And if we can get labor to a sustainable point, that's a big step into getting recycling to a sustainable point. Um, on the non-labor costs, Revenue continues to cover the cost of our dumpsters to the point where we have expanded our use of dumpsters down at the recycling center. Anyone who's been down there this week will have noticed that we've moved uh, mixed paper out of the truck and into dumpsters. So it is no longer an overhead lift with all of your old newspapers to deposit them. Uh, that has been very popular. Uh, and as we keep an eye on it, we keep an eye on what that's going to cost us and what our revenues look like, what our labor situation looks like, we may expand dumpster use because it takes the burden off labor and sort of puts it on to revenue, which is uh, a little bit easier to absorb. And it does improve customer service. So again, we are trying to find the efficiencies we can. We are trying to find the labor support we can. What we have today is not sustainable in the long run, but it's getting there and it's getting closer and we'll continue to improve it. Um, engagement, uh, there's been some articles in the newsletter, uh, WHSV is in story. Uh, I was interviewed for an episode of a Virginia Public Media documentary series. So uh, we'll be coming out soon. Uh, our recycling cheat sheets continue to fly off the shelves, literally and figuratively. Uh, and uh, in social media, uh, it's been mostly discussions of uh, scheduling. Uh, the recycling center is very weather dependent. So as we've gone through these last storms, a lot of discussion of when it's open, when it's not open, uh, and that will continue moving forward. All right, some of the issues and lessons learned, and, and actually this was in just an issues slide last time, but I think we can talk a little bit about ways that we're trying to make it better. Um, the big, the headline is Snoco in Fishersville is back in the plastic business. We're gonna start taking our number one and number two plastic there. That greatly reduces our transportation costs, but I will tell you right now, I'm very wary. We have been down this road with them before and it didn't end up very well for us. So we'll be doing this very cautiously. Uh, this is not a basket I wanna put a lot of eggs in right away but the dollars are just too good not to try. So we are doing that. We have had to suspend the collection of number four and number five plastic uh, until we can find a reliable source to get those recycled. Again, uh, I don't want to turn it on just to have to turn it off again. So we're going to want to make sure that our source is, uh, we have a high degree of confidence in our source before we do that. Uh, as far as space is concerned, I did impose upon uh, Parks and Rec to expand the footprint a third time and gobbled up a couple more parking spots. However, uh, dumpsters require less room than the trucks do. So if we increase our use of dumpsters, we may be able to start giving some of that space back. Uh, and also providing a little more uh, room for traffic flow. Uh, and obviously because the dumpsters tend to be much easier, that moves people through the center quicker as well. Uh, the key to using the dumpsters was uh, finding or more accurately creating locking dumpsters. 
Uh, there are locking dumpsters that are for recycling use. They're quite expensive, uh, but we didn't buy those. We worked with our dumpster supplier to rig up some eye hooks and cables and locks to uh, secure the dumpsters ourselves. It's not Fort Knox, but it seems to be working. And that allows us to uh, leave those dumpsters that are unattended and not worry that they're gonna be filled up with inappropriate materials when we come back. Um, on the education front, I can tell you that uh, it, it's getting better. Folks are getting used to uh, the sorting requirements. At this point, it isn't so much a question of how they sort, it's more a question of when they sort. Uh, we would still really prefer folks to sort it before they get there to help traffic flow. Uh, you know, we'll still help, and there's still an education aspect to it, but to the extent folks can bring their stuff pre-sorted, turn it in right away and, and move on out, that would be helpful. And then lastly, on the required assistance, uh, the more we use dumpsters, the less we have to help folks lift stuff, lift stuff up into the trucks. Uh, so it becomes uh, easier and easier. So uh, we're hoping to continue to make some advancements on that front. So here's where we are. Uh, and where we are today is in a pretty good spot. But between the last time I was up here and today, we were in some pretty dark spots. Uh, so we are continuing to make incremental improvements. Uh, if I can get, continue to fill vacancies and refuse, continue to achieve efficiencies in how we operate, we may have the wiggle room to start reviewing options for adding back those additional hours. But again, I don't want to do anything I have to undo or anything that I can't support. So we will be moving cautiously. To use a Winter Olympics analogy, I do not want to get out over my skis uh, in an attempt to squeeze out an extra long run only to wipe out at the end. So uh, I'll be back in another quarter. Uh, with hopefully uh, continued good news. And if you have any questions, I'm certainly willing to answer them. Are there any questions? I'm sorry. Go ahead. Uh, Jeff, have you had much trouble with uh, contaminated dumpsters? I mean, like people putting waxed cardboard in, um, in the dumpsters or any of that kind of stuff or, or it contaminates the whole load or? Uh, not really. Um, each commodity has its own quality requirements. Uh, so mixed paper and cardboard aren't necessarily as fastidious as plastic is. Uh, so what's, you know, there's, there's various levels of contamination. Uh, we don't see a lot of contamination of, of uh, while we're operating. The issue is when we show up in the morning and someone uh, overnight has helped themselves to uh, deposit something uh, that may or may not be appropriate. Uh, but uh, that has not been that great. And I think that also might be seasonal. Not as many people hanging out in the park when it's uh, 14 degrees outside. All right. Any additional questions or comments? Well, I have one. Do you guys by chance have any recycled dog houses? Because I need to put my husband in one. He took some boxes, cardboard boxes that I needed to use down to the recycling center before I could use them. So now well, I have to go out and buy new um, cardboard boxes. Yeah, I would say that it's, remember that uh, reduce, reuse, and recycle in that order. So to reuse something is always better than recycling. It. So you can, you can give him a finger wag from me as well. Okay, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> All right, well, thank you very much for that report. <clears throat> All right, the next item is item D, a discussion of Shenandoah Valley Animal Services Center. Ms. Beauregard. Thank you. So I'll first, I'm gonna provide a quick update on where we are, um, in particular, the summary of the owner's meeting that occurred last week. And then I'll be addressing the question of who um, might be best to serve as fiscal agent for the shelter. Um, but last week, the Shelter Executive Committee, also known as the owners, held a meeting to discuss several items, and here's a summary of that meeting. Um, first and foremost, there will not be an award for contract for the operation of the shelter. The owners will be retaining direct responsibility for shelter operations. Um, we will be meeting in the next few weeks to review and consider the following items. Uh, the owners recognize the need to improve the staffing model for the shelter which involves review of current positions and pay and new and additional positions. That's number one. 
Number two is the memorandum of understanding for operations and the original documents need some reviewing and updating. Number three, the currently uh, vacant veterinarian position and Mr. Fitzgerald is taking the lead on this and is following up on options. The advisory committee, and it has been suggested that the creation of an advisory committee would be a beneficial action and the owners will discuss this recommendation at our next meeting. And physical agency, um, and while at that meeting no final decision was made at, as to who, it seems likely that the fiscal agency will go away from Waynesboro. So now I'd like to talk about the fiscal agent piece for a moment. So per the MOU, and this is unlikely to change, this is exactly what the MOU says about the fiscal agent. The fiscal agent will maintain a program account for the receipt of funds paid by the member agencies and fees paid by the general public and for payment expenses for the operation, maintenance, repairs, and capital improvements to the animal shelter. The current MOU also states that shelter employees are employees of the fiscal agent and, allow, and follow all the policies and procedures of such. So that's what the fiscal agent does. Augusta County at that meeting offered and is willing to take over this function. And here's some reasons why they may be in a position of strength to do so. They have a dedicated staff member in place who can manage this and dedicate time to it. According to Mike Camp, he was doing much of the heavy lifting himself and did not have any dedicated staff and he found it more and more difficult over time um, as the demands increased and changed. The shelter is already located in Augusta County and it would be convenient for county staff to serve the shelter in times of need regarding maintenance and emergencies, for instance. Over 60% of the animals that come into the shelter do so from Augusta County and Stanton and Waysboro's numbers hover each at around 20%. These arrangements, this arrangement would maintain equity in terms of how many agencies each locality is responsible for. Transferring this responsibility from Waynesboro to Augusta County would mean that each jurisdiction is fiscal agent to two regional agencies each once the Middle River Regional Jail is its own fiscal agent, which should be occurring soon. I did, however, meet with our own staff to talk about the issues around Stanton taking over as fiscal agent, and there were several things relayed to me. First, we don't have dedicated staff, and as we spoke earlier when we were talking about the city manager recruitment process, we're already short staffed in the city manager's office. Um, Mr. Hamp expressed to me that several times it was him and him only, which was proven more and more difficult as I mentioned earlier. My initial concern is that we'd have the same situation in the city manager's office, given that we are in a current state of transition and we're down two people, including the clerk of council. And I couldn't think of another department that would make sense to function as that person who would uh, kind of be the liaison as the fiscal agent, for lack of a better word, between the city and the shelter in terms of those fiscal agent responsibilities. I talked to our public work staff. They would be the ones responding to calls for maintenance and emergencies and then drive to Lindhurst. In a how, I'm not sure how they would be to Lindhurst in a timely manner to address issues. We had some concerns over this. This would certainly require some special coordination and given the st staffing issues that our public works department already faces, I think that would probably stress the department out further. And finally, being a fiscal agent uh, adds an additional responsibility that would take away what really needs to happen as far as my role goes or whoever is in my role, which is to focus on the overall operations and shorten the long-term success of the shelter. The executive committee, according to the current MOU, clearly states that it is the body that has the responsibility for the overall operation of the shelter. And as long as I am in this role, I would prefer that to be the focus in terms of what I am doing is, would be to serve on the executive committee and provide that um, long and short term um, strategic um, uh, strategy for the shelter in terms of how do we make it more successful and how do we push forward with that. Uh, the next thing I want to address quickly also about the budget, and I did ask Augusta County about this, um, and if they were to become fiscal agent, and this is very similar to how Waynesboro works, the shelter budget would sit in its own fund, not the general fund, and that expenses and revenues appropriated for the shelter or for the shelter only. Even donations are held for their intended purpose or appropriated later, again, for the shelter. So again, only shelter activity can be in that fund. And with that is my intention, it is my intention to take Augusta County up on their offer to be the new fiscal agent for the shelter. 
Um, and then once the MOU is reviewed and revised, that will come in front of all the jurisdictions for their review and approval. And with that, I'm happy to address any questions. Uh, yes, sir. Vice Mayor Robertson. Is the shelter back open for rece receiving pets? Or I'm looking at the crowd. They are shaking. I believe so. Yes. They're for receiving their pets, but not, it's not visitors, right? Because I was there on Tuesday and the center was closed to, for, for folks to come in? I know it had been last week, Ms. Mead. I'm, it, yeah. Okay. Yeah, it had been last week because there were some COVID illnesses, I believe, but yeah. I, I hadn't seen an update, but they're shaking their head that it is back open. That's good right. to hear. Yes. Good, good. But you haven't had a vet, vet, veterinarian, have you? No, and Mr. Fitzgerald has taken the lead. And when we meet again as an executive committee, that is definitely on our agenda. Are there any? Uh, go ahead. This is um, Carolyn Dahl. So, so who is the dedicated staff person that Augusta County had sitting around waiting for a job? <laughs> well, she's not sitting around. She's an assistant to the county administrator. Um, she already, um, she is already uh, headed. She heads actually currently their animal control operations as well. So she's very familiar with this operation. Candy Hensley, I believe is her name. Well, you know, animal control is different from the animal shelter. Um, I, I have, it just seems bizarre to me. What, if they had somebody, a dedicated staff person that could have done it, why didn't they do it five years ago? It, it, I, I wonder, has there been a discussion of the kill rate of the animal shelter? In terms of what exactly? No. In terms, I, of, in terms of killing more animals as soon as they come in. No, ma'am. There has not. It, it, would There's, you please ask the other localities their thoughts on that? Because I would like reassurance that we're not going down that slippery slope. That will certainly be on the discussion. Yes, ma'am. All right. Thanks. Uh, Leslie, I, yes. I, I did go to the center on Tuesday and, um, and uh, you know, in, in addition to looking at the staffing levels and compensation, mm -hmm. um, the, the um, owners of the, of the um, center need to take a hard look at the, the uh, current uh, equipment that is, uh, that, that is in the center. The, the washer and dryer are, are ancient and uh, the staff has had to stick a screw in to the to the uh, uh, the lever that closes the washing machine and put tape over the top of it so they don't cut themselves when they open up the darn washing machine. the The dishwasher is a household dishwasher, and it quit, quit working, as I understand it, the first time it was used. So, so the the, the equipment needs of the center need to be ad ad addressed as well. The cabinets in the kitchen are falling apart. The ventilation is extremely poor. And, uh, and I, I probably cooked, could have picked a better time to arrive, but I got there at about 10 o'clock in the morning and they were, and you know, folks were working furiously to clean the kennels uh, after overnight, but the, 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 uh, I, the, the odor was indescribable. Just, I couldn't get it out of my nose for three hours after I left the center. And I, my hat's off to you folks who do that work because it's, it, it is, you know, bless your heart. Uh, it, I, I couldn't do it. I couldn't do it. And so, you know, a, a ventilation in that facility needs to be addressed. The kennels are falling apart. Uh, you, we have, you know, you have animals in there who are hurting themselves because the kennels are not safe. So the, the equipment needs of that facility need to be addressed as well as the, the uh, staffing needs. Any additional comments? This is Carolyn Dahl. Uh, One other point I wanted to make is that if, if there is consensus that the, the staff, including the, uh, an executive director, are being paid appropriately, if we could keep a, uh, an executive director out there, then then I would think that there'd be better monitoring and, and someone to make sure that 
things get repaired when they break or, or you know, that kind of thing. But they've been so short staffed out there, they, they couldn't even deal with any of that because they have animals coming and, you know, that need, need care. So um, I think it's, it could be a less of a day-to-day -day, uh, imposition on, on any locality uh, if they pay the, someone, you know, a decent wage for that kind of position. Couldn't agree more. Yep. Chancellor Darby. Leslie, when is your next executive meeting? We haven't it? set it up yet. It'll be in a couple of weeks, probably the week of February 22nd. And my intent actually is to visit. I have not been out there, so I want to visit the shelter before then as well. So I'm going to arrange some time to do that. Can you just keep us abreast sure. of like, because I just don't, I, I just I, don't want weeks to go by no, absolutely. and they not have what they need. Yes, yes, I will do that. And um, I know there was some question about um, how meetings are noticed and how do people find out about meetings. Right. So I think we need to do a better job at that as well. So people know to show up at the owner's meetings because the public is obviously welcome unless we have a closed portion session. So um, I'm gonna mention that the next time with the owners to make sure that it's noticed. I mean, we put the notice down here in city hall um, you know, for instance, but we can do, you know, certainly we can do better than that. So, but I'll certainly, yes, ma'am, I'll keep everybody up to date as we move along. Well, that was going to be one of my questions, um, whether or not the owner's meetings are open to the public sure are. and how yep. are they being advertised? Uh, that, uh, my question is about how they're advertised as well, and they most certainly are open to the public. Yes, ma'am. Okay. Um, one thing I'm hearing from the public, uh, they do have concerns about maintaining um, the save rate and what measures will be put in place to keep the um, high percentage of uh, the save rate? Yeah, 97% mm -hmm. at this time. That that's, goes along to the council member Stahl's question as well about yeah. the kill rate, which is the opposite the of save rate. rate. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so yeah, that will definitely be a point of discussion for the executive committee. And of course, when we're getting staff on, you know, when we have a director in place and, you know, mm -hmm. all these things will start happening. Again, it, <laughs> we really do need to get the staffing stabilized. Um, that's a big thing that has to happen, of course. So. Okay. Um, another point that I've heard from many um, citizens is the educational piece, just getting um, some educational material mm -hmm. out there to the community. Yes about proper pet care and what to expect. Yeah, and there's been offers made from groups about that. So we'll definitely be re, you know, taking them up on that offer as well. So any, um, you know, because I don't proclaim to be an expert in this at all, we'll be looking to groups who know, you know, what that means and how to do that and how to educate folks and put those materials together to help do all that. So reaching out to do that will be very important. What to expect when you're expecting a puppy or kitten. <laughs> that could be number one, absolutely. Yes, so. um, a shelter animal. It's very important that we take care of our fur babies. All right, are there any additional comments, questions? All righty. So at this point, we are under matters from the acting city manager. No, me. Okay. I only have three items. Um, at the last meeting, we mentioned that the Virginia Health and Safety Codes Board was going to meet on February 7th. They ended up rescheduling their meeting for February 16th at 10 a.m. And this has to do with the masking in City Hall. Um, it will be held at either the Fairfield Library in Richmond or in the Patrick Henry Building in Richmond. Um, I can forward a link to the agenda and the remote participation instructions to anyone who's interested. Second item is next week from February 16th to 18th, the Virginia Local Government Management Association, also known as VLGMA, their winter conference will be here in Stanton at Hotel 24 South. Uh, VLGMA is the Local Government Managers State Association, so it's my association. And I've been asked to make some welcoming remarks to the local government managers who are coming from around the state to stay and spend money in our amazing city. Mm -hmm. so that's, that would be exciting. Um, finally, the sidewalk repairs at Gypsy Hill, Duck, Gypsy Hill Park Duck Pond are set to begin next week. These are the areas that were damaged by the 2020 floods. Uh, work will continue into the spring and summer and visitors to the park just need to be on the lookout for construction zones in those areas and impacts to parking. But when it's done, the work will have significantly improved the resilience of the repaired areas and future flooding events while still maintaining its historic appearance. 
And Madam Mayor, that is my report for this evening. All right, so um, the next item is matters from the public, if you can hang in there. All right. This part of the city council's agenda is entitled matters from the public. It is a time that council sets aside to hear from citizens and others about a wide variety of subjects. Before we begin, I'd like to share five basic ground rules that we ask you to respect as you make your remarks. One, please come to the podium or begin your call, identify yourself and complete your remarks within five minutes. I will let you know when you've reached your five minutes. We ask that you please give your name, your address, and then keep your remarks at five minutes or less. When you reach the five minute time limit, I'll let you know that your time limit has expired. If you continue to speak, I will ask you to step away from the podium or to end your call. If you continue to speak after I inform you that you have exceeded your time limit, I will ask you again to please step away from the podium or end your call. If you still continue to speak, I will ask the clerk of council to end your call. And if you continue to speak from the podium, you may be charged with disorderly conduct under Virginia code section 18.2-415A2. Number two, this is a time for us as council simply to listen to your remarks. In an effort to encourage and maintain orderly conduct, we will not engage in give and take debate. If you are seeking information, you may mention it during your remarks and the city manager or her staff may get in touch with you in the days of HID. Three, we ask that you direct your comments to council as a whole and not to identify members of council or to an individual employee of the city. If you wanna take up an issue with an individual member of council or an employee, please speak with us before or after the meeting. We are also accessible by phone, mail, or email. Again, we ask that you direct your comments to the council as a whole. Four, we expect every speaker to be civil and courteous, using profanity, making personal attacks on an individual unrelated to the performance of their official duties on behalf of the city of Stanton and doing anything that is disrupted to the orderly conduct of this meeting will not be tolerated. Five, finally, as the presiding officer, it is my duty to remind you that if you choose not to abide by these ground rules, I may find that you are out of order and will ask you to withdraw from the podium or to end your call. We certainly do not want to reach that point and even beyond. So we respectfully ask for your full cooperation in observing these guidelines. If you wish, you may obtain a copy of the ground rules from our interim clerk of council, Ms. Smith. And now we welcome all speakers. The podium is now available for matters from the public as well as remote participants using the Zoom platform. So again, if you can come to the, plat um, come to the uh, podium, state your name, your address, keep your comments at five minutes or less. Um, and as far as questions, you can ask questions, but we're not going to answer them. We will simply listen. Um, our staff can follow up with you um, later, either after the meeting or in the future. And with that, matters from the public, it's now open. Go ahead, Mr. Fossa. Hello, my name is Albino Albert Fossa. Albert was given to me by a teacher at one time when I was in the first grade and I couldn't speak English. I was an Italian at that time. My mother was Italian. And as a result, Albert was attached to my name rather than Albino. But she suffered. She didn't come back the next year, unfortunately. But what I have to say usually takes more than five minutes. The last time I was here, you threw me out. Why? I don't know. What I was speaking about the, uh, the jail had the courthouse or whatever, I was going to end it up by saying that if given the opportunity, I would take five prisoners and make them redo the jailhouse in Stanton, paint it, clean it up, put new fixtures in it, new bedrooms and so forth and so on. And that expense would be very little. That's what I was going to end up with. But I would, didn't get that opportunity because you, you threw me out, unfortunately. That's out of order. Secondly, I want to apologize to Mrs. Dull. You asked her why she is here. She's here because she was elected to represent a group of people, to provide government of the people by the people and for the people, just like each and every one of you. There comes a time now, also at that meeting, there was a group from the high school who said kindness matters. And I'm loud because in some ways I can't speak other than that way. 
okay? And I apologize for my tone of voice, but I do have integrity. I know the difference between what's right and what's wrong, and I have always tried to do the right thing until somebody told me that that wasn't the right thing and gave me an explanation. I've come in before this council many times, and I've got no reaction at all from this council. None. Zero. Why? I don't know. I can't understand who makes the decisions and why you people cannot have harmony within all of you. It doesn't take very much to say to someone, I'm sorry, I apologize. I'm sorry. Okay, you have a right to speak and you have an opinion and that's to leave it at that. But you should start to work together because there's not four of you. There's how many of you? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven of you. All right. And that's what should run this city. This city needs cooperation from all of you, not just a few of you, all of you. You need to swallow whatever things you have or whatever hate you have and so forth. And there, like I said, there are many things I can still say. As far as this business about the animal shelter, there was a person who lived in the county. He was a multimillionaire. He passed away this past summer. At one time, he was a contributor to the shelter. He had millions and millions of dollars. I wonder how much they received from that person when he passed on. And he only passed on about five or six months ago. Okay, maybe you can check on that person. I don't know. He had good points and he had some terrible evil points, believe me. But the good points, well, they sort of balance the evil ones. Anyway, what you should do before you, and about this other business, about uh, this, uh, what is it? This uh, equity and diversity. Think twice before you vote for that thing. Think twice, because that's going to open up many, many, many cans of worms. Many cans of worms. And will they supersede <coughs> your authority? You have the authority now to do whatever that commission can do. Will they, will, will they upsur your authority? Think about it. Before you get too far involved, you should have job specs for each and every one of you. What are your job specs? What is your responsibility? And stop this inside fighting that goes on, this hate that goes on. I can't believe that this is Stanton. When I was a kid, I thought about coming to Stanton, about going to the military academy. It never happened until just Mr. over Mr. your time is up. And I'm finished. Thank you. Right. Okay? Right. But try to have, have any, some right, Thank you, Mr. Fossa. Uh, do we have anyone with their hand raised? I have no one with their hand raised. All right. Hey, welcome. Hi, uh, my name is Amy Hammer. I'm the president of Augusta Dog Adoptions, but I actually live in Highland County. Um, I'm here tonight mostly just to sincerely thank you all for your commitment to maintaining SVASC as a municipal shelter. When we heard the news in November that an RFP had been put out um, to possibly manage it, we were stressed out, um, we were heartbroken. It was a very difficult time for the staff, uh, rescue partners, volunteers, and community members. So we certainly thank you for listening to us and for putting the well-being of the animals first. Kind of mixing things up just a little bit because you ask uh, about supervising vets. So I wanted to speak to that just really quick. Um, we have been without a super, they have not we, they have been without a supervising vet since January um, the 1st. So um, with being out that for almost a month, on January the 28th, um, I had a vet come in there uh, from Westwood Animal Hospital. And uh, what she did was basic vaccines for all the animals. You can't do that without a protocol and a supervising vet. So we got everyone's vaccines all caught up. 
Um, she did checkups for some of the animals with more special needs um, and got some basic medications for some skin issues, um, some upper respiratory tract infections. Um, I got that paid for um, by Richmond Animal Care and Controls Tommy Fund. So that didn't cost you all a cent. Um, I was there for three hours. They were still working on animals when I left. So all that was provided um, uh, by another, by uh, a nonprofit group with the extra funds um, and who also want you all to be successful. Um, so again, that's been a couple weeks ago now. There's a few more animals that need some medical care. Um, they're going to pay for individual um, appointments for three or four of the animals that need to go right away. Um, and then we also have another uh, farm call set up for them to come to the shelter again next Friday. I think it's the 17th or the 18th. So that's how we're making it work because you can't have animals in a shelter for, for weeks without vet care. It's just, it's not possible. Um, my camp did clarify that if there's a further delay in the supervising vet, um, that that is uh, an expense that, that will be taken on by the localities. So it was very nice of them to do that for us now, but they may not, you know, it's not a long-term situation. Um, so just that. Um, I really want to ask you all to consider being the fiscal agent. It doesn't sound like you're in the position to do that. Um, but really my biggest worry uh, is about an imbalance of power and potential conflict of interest if Augusta County has the same person supervising the shelter as they do their animal control officers. I didn't, I suspected that would happen. I did not know it for fact until um, we were told that Candy uh, Hensley We'll take that job. Um, I don't want to say anything too negative, um, but I am going to say that Augusta County animal control officers are not at the professional level that the city of Stanton is, okay? And I think that's a supervisory issue with them, um, and that makes me nervous for the shelter. Um, I think it would be too much power for one person. We need someone in there that is going to work on their relationship. Um, and I'm, and so I would like to see it be a different person. Um, I really do love the idea of an advisory committee. And I think that's a really important step in making sure that one locality doesn't have too much power. Um, I think we saw with Waynesboro what can go wrong and we all, we don't want that to ever happen again. So we're invested in you know, your success. And I really do hope that one of you all will be on that advisory committee too. There's just so many miscommunications, like for you all to actually be involved directly, I think is really going to benefit all of us. Um, so again, you know, I worked for Stanton for five years. I lived in Stanton for 11 years. Like I believe in your professionalism and I just, I hope that you guys will really continue to be involved and really look at the best ways. When we put this back together, we're gonna to do it right. All right, thank you for your time and your service. Thank you. Do you have anyone with their hands raised? I do have someone with their hand raised, so just one moment. Um, caller, please go ahead and um, state your name and your address. Uh, sure. Yes, this is Nitch Narduzzi. I'm on South Jefferson Street. I was just calling in to say that I am very excited to know that we are moving forward with the um, Diversity and Equity Commission. I hope that the council will lean heavily on Dr. Stacia's recommendations and expertise, especially um, with appointments to that commission. Um, I'm glad to hear that it's not going to be in the hands and the sole decision of the nominations committee, as I do have some concerns about their ability to make those appointments alone. And so uh, instead of taking up too much time with my own opinions, what I would like to address is why that commission is badly needed. Uh, for the same reason that the mayor some months ago was called out by our newspaper for the misappropriation of Martin Luther King quotes. Uh, our vice mayor just did this again tonight in the meeting. And while I am humiliated by what he had to say in front of Dr. Stacia, I'm hoping that he will in the future 
be willing to listen to some constructive feedback. And so what I'm going to do is just read a portion of an article from Forbes magazine. When Dr. King famous, famously said, I have a dream that my four little children will one day live in a nation where they will not be judged by the color of their skin, but by the content of their character, the masses gathered at the March on Washington for Jobs and Freedom understood the context. His I Have a Dream speech was premised on the notion that 100 years after the Emancipation Proclamation, that the Negro still is not free. Dr. King spoke to the shameful condition of the United States defaulting on the promissory note of guaranteeing the unalienable rights of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness insofar as her citizens of color are concerned. Almost 60 years later, the speech still provides practical guidance about what it will take for the United States to make justice a reality for all of God's children. The I Have a Dream speech prescribed a powerful hope for righting injustices facing children today, creating a world where people are not color blind, but color kind. Dr. King's line about not judging his children by the color of their skin, but by the content of their character is too often shamefully applied to argue against affirmative action or any race-based remedy to historical injustice. But I have a dream speech itself contradicts this in his bold call for fighting the fight until justice rolls down like waters and righteousness like a mighty stream. Moreover, his public views before and after his speech included support of the Indian government's special employment opportunities provided to the caste formerly referred to as untouchables as a remedy for this discrimination of victims. Social reforms for African Americans similar to the GI Bill and a call for massive reparations that were bold but less expensive than any computation based on two centuries of unpaid wages and accumulated interest. In essence, Dr. King's argument is not to be colorblind, but to be color kind. Thank you. Thank you. Would anyone else like to come to the podium? Welcome. Thank you. I'm Renee Clark, volunteer with Cat's Cradle. Um, I also want to thank you guys so much for um, not proceeding with the RFP and the localities keeping the shelter. We feel like that's going to be um, a lot safer for the animals. Um, we still uh, would love for Stan to consider to be the fiscal agent. Uh, that is our preference. Again, for a multitude of issues, I thank um, you guys our leaders in our community and definitely have a, a vision of, you know, the maximum save rate that's very understood, um, but also understand that there are some, you know, issues that might have to be worked out um, that might make that a limiting factor. Um, with that said, uh, I do think whichever locality decides to take the lead, um, Stanton or Augusta, our preference is definitely that the fiscal agent or the direct supervisor of the shelter um, is not animal control supervisor. Um, I also agree that I think that that really creates um, a lot of power in one person. And I think that's the one thing that we've learned from um, the past is that you need that spread out. So I also think that um, although it was a little overwhelming when Waynesboro had it, you know, the county administrator might be the more appropriate person than the animal control supervisor or his assistant, uh, because if they get a good executive director in there, I don't think the needs will be as great. I think if you, you know, get a good position description and you hire someone with a good salary, um, truthfully, the fiscal agent may just need to know what's going on and make some of the top level decisions. Um, I'm also in support of the advisory board. I would like to recommend that um, some key players from Possibly Rescue who've been um, supporting directly, maybe the most in the shelter, but also I'd like to recommend, um, as Amy said, maybe one member of a board of supervisors from each locality or the, you know, the county, maybe on there, one from each. So we have like a spread out of the power. So that way it keeps you guys more directly involved than just the owner's group and have that be separate from the owner's group, you know, where they can talk to each other and get ideas and just, and again, we're talking about an advisory role. So they still, the owners would still have the ultimate decision, 
but you would have this support of this group who you know are people who are hands-on, who know what's going on, but you also have an opportunity to learn from each other as members of the Board of Supervisors and City Council. So, you know, I think that would be good. Um, right now, our biggest concern is they do not have a vet. And again, uh, some of their maintenance needs that you mentioned, um, we've been trying to reach out to volunteers in the community to help them in this time of need. Some of that's been successful. We had some of the kennels fixed by a volunteer, uh, various other things. Some of it hasn't been successful. Like you said, they've got a really old, you know, equipment there. Um, I would like to see this advisory board be formed sooner than later, like really quickly, because my other question would be, um, I know they're trying to move quickly on the executive director position, which I'm all for, but I also think it needs to be done right. Um, we need to look at position descriptions from other communities who have done this right and what their salary requirements are, and possibly maybe they could look to this advisory board to help them with the position descriptions and maybe even advise them on some of the hiring. Um, if that's necessary, because I think this executive director position and who they directly report to is going to be the most important thing of anything. Um, so you got to get that in place. And we don't want to go backwards. I think um, the owners need to be thinking of the biggest question should be, I know everyone has the best intentions at heart in all localities, but how do we maintain this fantastic save rate? Uh, we want to make sure that we keep the many great things that they have going on miraculously, which we can't believe, and fix the stuff that really needs to be fixed, which truthfully is mostly personnel issues and management issues and maintenance. So, you know, you've got them promoting pet retention. It's working great. We don't want to go backwards on that. They're working with rescues. It's working great. We don't want to go backwards on that. So there's a lot of stuff that we are a little worried we want to make sure that you know we stay positive and we don't go backwards so if there's anything we can do to help you guys but like i said i think them supervising animal control and the executive director is going to create an issue so we hope you can push for that not to happen whichever locality thank y'all thank you right anyone else with their hand raised i have no one with their hand raised great welcome evening council um, I am Ms. Crawford. I do reside in the city of Stanton. Um, I would like to bring a couple of recommendations to your attention. The funding that you're wanting to use to expand the jail, um, I think is absurd. That's a large lump of money. That money can be used to put, to be put into a program to stop incarceration, to also help the people that are incarcerated that when they get out to readjust to society because when they come out, they have no idea what they're opening up to. My other recommendation to you is to not sit on the board and allow your citizens to come to you with suggestions, concerns, and things that bother them with no feedback. What that does is causes, you got people that are upset, you, you got confusion, what that does is cause division between yourself and the citizens of the city. That pushes us away to come to you for help when help is needed, okay? This is the first go around of my city council member meetings that I have been to that I have never been able to get feedback standing at this podium. I think it's unacceptable and I think it's a wrong move. Thank you. All right, thank you. Do you have anybody with their hand raised? with no one with their hand raised. Okay, welcome. Hi, my name is Vicki Floyd and I'm a member of a very small rescue group, Critter Haven. Most of our animals are gonna live out their life with us because a family member died and family didn't want them, that kind of thing. But more importantly, myself and my partner were the owners of Happy Critter Resort that y'all bought for the shelter. It was very small and one of the stipulations was I had to stay there six months through the transition. It was the hardest six months of my life because it was small and we were overwhelmed and there was a lot of euthanasia. Um, also, um, everything was in very working order, very good condition, all of that. And I was so upset 
to realize how bad of a condition everything went. In Waynesboro, we had a meeting before it was sold, but I had to agree to stay. Waynesboro wanted to take it over and wanted to run it. That's how they got it. And um, as far as the municipalities, I agree with Amy about Stanton. I worked at the time with her, a uh, person from Waynesboro and with the county dog wardens and such. And Stanton was just so educated, not only to the care of the animals, but the time and commitment that Amy put in even after her hours, but she knew, seemed like more educated and knew what to do and what was going on. And the others were there as dog wardens as a job or whatever, but Stanton just seemed more up to what needed to be done, how it needed to be done. The advisory board, I think is a wonderful idea. Um, the thing with, and the fellow left, but the thing saying the big donations left by the deceased person and all that, we need to make that very clear. That does not go to us, I started to say us. <laughs> that does not go to the Animal Service Center. All of those things people hear about are going to the regional SPCA. We don't, they don't get anything, some donations they get. They have a volunteer group now that is 501c3 that does fundraisers and things like that. And every now and then somebody might give them a donation, but they don't get those big grants and those big memorial funds and everything that people think that is going to the SPCA and I think that needs to be known too, so more people will say, hey, these guys are working their cells really hard and they need things and let's help them. And um, as far as when they need something, we, I, I had no idea the equipment was so bad, but every group of us would gladly get together, do fundraisers, get the extra funds they need. But to me, the equipment and stuff is the owner's responsibility. You keep that building up. They come up with a weird expense or a medical bill that y'all don't have funds for, notify us. We'll all get together in a big thing and have a fundraiser and help in any way we can. Not just to foster or take things out, but help. You get this building back in shape and we'll all pull together and see that things run easy, run normally. And uh, another one I wanna mention is Tracy. She's been there since whew, the beginning. She has more or less every time a director's not there, she pretty much runs the place. Everybody texts her about questions and she needs a good pay too because she thought of leaving at one point and we all were in a panic that she was going. But I'm glad y'all took it over and just wanted to make a few things clear. And I am so proud of the work that those girls did. One of my things, we sold it at a good price because we wanted it to be animal friendly. And for them to work that hard for a 97% rate, I am so proud of them, but so disappointed in the other aspects of it. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone with their hands raised? I have no one with their hands raised. All right. Welcome. Hi, um, I'm Jean Frazier. Um, I live in Augusta County and I volunteer at the shelter. And since I'm retired, I'm there a lot. And um, I really want to thank you for the way that you, your consideration and, and kindness in dealing with this matter. I mean, we were, everybody was extremely stressed over that RFP idea. We're glad it went away. And uh, I see things, I see things getting better. Um, I really, I hope that all the communities do work together. There needs to be oversight. Um, there is always tension between Augusta County Animal Control and the people who work at the shelter and some of the ideals are in different directions. So that is something that needs to, to be addressed. Um, we don't really, really know if, you know, if somebody's, 
their point of their point of view needs to be balanced and we the advisory committee would be an excellent idea to have people know what is going on and um yep director it would be great to to get a director and get things get things organized get um maintenance and the facilities management and that sort of thing just to get it taken care of better than it has been in the past but like i said we are so appreciative of your attention to this matter so thank you very much thank you great anyone with their hands raised i have no one with their hands raised anyone from the audience Okay, hearing none, as mayor of the city of Stanton, I call the February 10th, 2022 meeting adjourned.